When I was younger, I used to be obsessed with ghosts and all sort of haunting shows. Now, I'd never particularly had a reason to believe that my house was haunted, but one day my brother came home claiming to have found ten dollars out of nowhere. I'll never know for sure if he was just messing with me, but after curiosity got a hold, I asked him where he really got the money from. Stupid me assumed maybe a friend? Perhaps he stole it from my parents' wallet? My parents never claimed to have been missing any money, however, something they definitely would have voiced being distraught about had they noticed that we had taken their cash. The story he gave me was that a young girl, maybe about the age of seven, had followed him onto the school bus that afternoon. He had never met this girl before, and had never seen her around at school, but she decided to sit in the seat right in front of him. After riding the bus for a while, she started to talk to him. Nobody else could see her, according to him, and the other kids were giving him weird looks. Eventually, she handed him ten dollars with a note, and then subsequently got off the bus at the next stop. I immediately assumed that he was lying and laughed, of course. I asked him to show me the note, which he promptly retrieved from his room and passed me a tiny piece of paper. A shiver ran down my spine, as the note wasn't in his handwriting. It read, I'll help you, but only this time, which I believe was in response to the fact that my brother was begging my parents for a Zelda charm bracelet for months, which they refused to buy him. Given that he had ten dollars now, he could just buy it himself, though. Of course, I was extremely intrigued by this, even if it sounded absurd. I suggested we make a makeshift Ouija board to see if we could contact anyone. So we wrote the alphabet on a piece of paper and grabbed a necklace to hover above the DIY board. My brother was interested too, so he decided it could be fun. Mind you, I was in sixth grade and he was in the fourth at the time, so any sort of movement from the necklace caught our attention and we immediately thought that it was a ghost. After asking a few questions, the necklace began to move and shake. Either my brother was really good at tricking me by slowly sliding the necklace across the board, or it really was something paranormal. We were able to get a name. Kate. After asking dumb things like, did you watch me complete the Shadow Temple in Ocarina of Time, and getting a yes, me and my brother decided to stop for the night after starting to get creeped out. We never said goodbye before ending. Eventually, playing with the board would be a daily occurrence. We thought we'd made a friend, and truly believed that someone was talking to us. Me and my brother decided to take things a step further and try to record something. So we both got our tablets, placed them in front of our TV, and hit record. The first thing I asked was, if someone was here, move something in the room. There was nothing. Okay, well, maybe the ghost is shy? We decided to repeat the same question, but this time we said that we would leave the room and give it a minute. We went downstairs for five minutes, and when we got back up, our tablets had both fallen to the floor and stopped recording. Coincidence? I mean, things fall especially when you're not careful at placing them. So we brushed it off. In December of sixth grade, though, things got really weird. I had started hearing voices in my head, claiming that they were the ghost I was talking to while playing the Ouija board. I got so scared one night that I had grabbed the Bible that one of my religious friends had gifted me, and would sleep with it. Eventually, I told my mom that there was a ghost telling me scary things. I won't get into detail, as some of it was a little graphic. She and my dad argued for a while about whether or not I was schizophrenic, and if I should see a therapist. So, out of fear, I never told them that I was hearing voices again, but I would space out often, talking and having conversations with this thing that I believed to be a ghost. Eventually, I forgot about the ghost, and we no longer talked. I will never know what that voice was, if I was genuinely insane, or if they were just intrusive thoughts. I was just glad for it finally to have stopped. Nothing necessarily paranormal has happened to me since, besides my TV turning on randomly in the middle of the night or feeling that someone was pushing my legs with some sort of unknown force every once in a while. I sum it up to just be my imagination playing tricks on me now.
but I do still have this looming feeling that ever since I've played with that Ouija board, I have some sort of spirit attached to me, following me. Not a bad one, but just a constant presence. This happened when I was around nine or ten. I was staying the night at my friend Catherine's for the first time. We met the summer before and were inseparable ever since. Cat lived in this old two-story house surrounded by woods and dirt road. The house itself gave me an uneasy feeling when I first saw it. The shutters were falling off. The paint on the house seemed to be fading. It was an old piece of crap now that I think about it. But at the time, I was nervous and excited. I remember walking in after I stared at the house for what seemed like 20 minutes. Surprisingly, the inside was a lot nicer than the outside, so I pushed that uneasy feeling down and just shrugged it off as nerves. I remember the smell of the house. I can't pinpoint it, but it was different, like walking into a musty room. I started to walk around just to explore my surroundings, but I noticed Kat's mom watching me. I simply smiled and waved, but she just stood there staring at me wide-eyed. I've never met her before, but why was she looking at me like that? Suddenly, Cat flew around the corner and tackled me. We both fell and started to giggle. I noticed Cat's mom out of the corner of my eye start to turn around and walk off. She was gone, just like that. Fast forward a couple hours. Cat and I are laying on a beanbag in her room watching Children of the Corn, which, by the way, was one of my favorite movies at the time. I grew up watching horror movies, mostly Stephen King or any movie my mom was watching. Not her decision, mine, because I love the feeling that a good horror movie gives you. She felt the same way, and that's why we clicked so much. Back to the story. We were sitting here watching this movie, and suddenly the door opposite us slams closed. We both jumped, giggled, and brushed it off because, well, we were kids. Until the second time, when it creaked open and slammed again, not even seconds after the first time. Now I'm sitting there staring at this door, trying to figure out how in the hell it's opening and closing by itself. In the midst of all that, the only other person in this house is her mom, who I figured out earlier was just a tad bit creepy. You think it's just your mom? I asked her, but she shook her head. You sure? I asked again, but she said something that gave me chills, and still gives me chills, just telling this story. My mom isn't home, it's just me and you, silly. I just stare at her while she's staring at me, trying to wrap my head around what she had just told me. Where is your mom? I asked her. She's at work. I giggled, thinking that she was just trying to trick me. She is at work. She only works for a couple hours, so she leaves me here because she trusts me. At this point, I'm just looking at her, and she noticed this look of concern on my face. What's wrong? she asked. If your mom is at work, then who was that lady looking at me earlier? As I said this, we heard what seemed like footsteps at the time. But thinking about it now, it sounded like shuffling in one spot above us. I'm completely terrified at this point. Every hair on my neck is standing on end, and I just want to leave. I start to get up when Cat pulled me back down and asked me if I had heard the noise. I nodded. It was silent again until the footsteps were back, but louder and faster. We both gazed up at the ceiling and she grabbed my hand. This happens every day, she whispered. I look over at her and can truly see the fear on her face. The footsteps stopped and she looked at me, her face flushed white. Is there an attic? I asked. She pointed up toward the ceiling. Well, maybe it's just squirrels or birds, I kept thinking over and over. You ever notice when you're really quiet? That's when you can hear almost everything around you. Imagine if you're sitting in a house with your best friend alone at 10 years old and you hear the giggle of a three-year-old child. Mind you, she has no younger brothers or sisters. We were completely alone. Cat was just as scared as I was. I remember thinking that I just wanted to get out of the house. Just grab her and run out the door. At least we would feel safer and less scared outside than we would in. 
Want to hear a story? Kat asked, pulling my mind back to reality. I nodded. Well, this house used to be a daycare. There was this lady that would watch the kids, and one day she just locked them in the attic and then hung herself from a rope in the kitchen. They all died because the kids were hungry and thirsty and no one found them for months in this house. My heart started to pound. My eyes were wide with fear. It's true, she said. I've seen them, the little kids, every day. But I never saw the lady, but you have, earlier. After she told me this, I don't remember much else aside from running out the door of her room and making it outside that house. Cat followed, begging me to stay, but I just had to leave. My stomach felt like it was in knots. I felt like I had walked into a horror movie myself and just wished that this day had never happened. Fast forward to years later. That was the last day that I had seen or heard from Cat. I remember her always coming to play outside at my dad's during the day. I remembered what she looked like. I remembered meeting her parents and seeing them out in public. I'm now 27, and I can't seem to find any proof that she even existed. All my friends that I was friends with then, I'm still friends with now, even after all these years. But why not her? I drove by that house maybe 15 times, and still wonder if maybe she was just one of the ones that never made it out. For a little backstory, my partner and I have been dating for about a year and a half. This February, I was given tickets as a birthday gift to finally visit him, as I'm in Scotland. Experience 1. I spent the middle of February over in Arizona visiting my partner. While we're both interested in the paranormal, I believe in it all, having had multiple experiences, whereas he tends to just humor me, not believing in it much himself. He's never mentioned anything odd happening in his apartment, but I saw, heard, and felt small things the first couple of days that I was there. One morning in particular at around 4 a.m. I was on the sofa playing on my phone, jet lag, when I looked up and saw a figure standing over him as he slept. It was similar to a shadow person phenomenon, just a dark humanoid shape, but it felt nasty. When I saw it, it turned, almost as if it was startled to see someone else in the room. Never mind, someone who could also see it. It did sort of a double take and then disappeared, but the energy in the room felt off. I performed a cleansing ritual that I've come to rely on when negative energies are bothering me. For the remainder of my trip, the apartment felt light and airy, with the exception of later that day when I was taking a nap and felt what I thought was my partner standing over me watching me sleep. I opened my eyes and felt the negative presence over me as though trying to work out who I was and why I was there. It was then told in very clear terms that it wasn't welcome whether I was there or not, and it cleared out. No more issues, so that was fine. Experience 2 My partner's friends, another couple, really helped in making me feel welcome, and the four of us went out on road trips a couple of times, once to Jerome and another to a recreational spot by a lake. I felt a little funny any time we were driving around near or on the reservations, as though the native spirits were very much aware of us going through their land, but nothing felt bad, just sort of a curiosity. But one instance in particular sticks out. While driving toward Phoenix after a day at the lake, we were all chatting away in the car when we got into reservation territory. I got that not alone feeling again, but still, it was curious, though this time it was more intense. There was a lull in the conversation and I was just admiring the landscape as the sun was going down, when in the middle of the center embankment on the road, there was a figure that suddenly appeared out of nowhere. I know it was male, and I know that he was a Native American. Nothing felt wrong, but when I asked if anyone else had seen him, they all said no. Despite the fact that, as far as I was concerned, you couldn't miss him. He was old, tall, and completely white. His clothes, hair, everything. With an aura of hazy light around him, simply standing and watching over the road. I don't know who he was, but it felt like he was watching over the people traveling through his land. 
It was comforting. Believe it or not, my story is true. My name is Brandy, I am 56, and I live in Washington. All these years, my kids wanted me to write down events that happened to myself and my loved ones. Quite a few members of my family have recently passed away, leaving so many untold stories that I didn't want these experiences to die with me. So for my children, here it goes. A lot of messed up and supernatural things have happened to us in our lifetime, most with witnesses. This is one of them. About 27 years ago, while house hunting for a rental, I met the former renter of this rundown but livable house. She warned me not to live in this house because I have small children. And not only was it run down, it was very haunted and never she was stern. Never let a man live here with you because he will be taken over by the evil that resides within. Now, I'm thinking she's either crazy or she was just mad at the landlord for something. We needed a home incredibly desperately. I was also thinking that I had lived through worse and houses could always be cleansed, so I blew it off. I ended up renting the house, but I soon realized that I should have heeded her warning. The house was musty and old, made of wood, the walls, the ceilings, and the floors were all wood. Even the bedroom doors blended in with the walls, but the bedrooms were painted on the other side. There were French doors all along the front of the house going into an enclosed but open-viewed screen porch with a front door. The main living space was long and open, the living and dining area were stretched into one long room, and it was always cold despite having the heater on and it being in the desert. It was located in the high desert of California on the corner of an acre lot of barren desert, and across the street there was a popular grocery store and a few small shops too far away for anyone to hear us. It served as a town hall back in the day, and I think a turkey ranch before that. It was 6 a.m., and we had planned a three-day trip to the happiest place in the world, Disneyland. My kids, Michael, age 1, Penny, age 4, and Jenny, age 3, were all sleeping on my bed in our bedroom at the other end of the house so I could pack in peace for the trip in the dining room and not wake them. I could see the bedroom door, though, and it was closed. I was standing up folding clothes at the table. My boyfriend's mother, Opal, was sitting across from me when we heard the bedroom door creak open slightly. We both looked up, and it was my daughter, Jenny, in her little pink and white flowered onesie. I said, now you know it's too early, go back to bed. And she replied, me up now, mommy, in her little sweet voice. It made us both chuckle, and I told Opal that I thought she was just excited. I told her no, that we weren't going right now, so please go back to bed. She stomped her foot, which we could feel vibrate through the floorboards. Opal then told me that I had better go and put her back, and I agreed. As I was making that long walk toward her, I was keeping eye contact, and as I was walking, I was telling her, No, baby. And once again, she stomps her foot, smiles, and says louder, Me up, with the sweetest little smile, and she tilted her head. Opal even muttered, Aww. It didn't dawn on me at the time how perfect that her little pigtails were. At this point, I'm extending my hands toward her. I get about six inches from touching her and all of a sudden she turned black and disappeared almost like sand falling to the ground, followed by the door quickly closing behind her. Opal said, what the hell, in surprise. Shocked, I stood there with my hands still extended, and then the fear ran through my body like hot and cold needles. My kids were all sleeping behind that door. I grabbed the handle and swung open the door, fearing the worst, only to find my little Jenny fast asleep with her sister's leg over her. Whatever we had seen, it couldn't have been her. Although unsettling, Opal and I didn't talk about what had happened, and later that morning we all piled into the car and went on our trip. 
We had a great time, but when we came home, we were met with all of the lights on and old music playing loudly coming from inside. People were standing around in my living room. Two separate groups, like two different periods of time. I turned to my boyfriend and asked how those people got in and if he left the door unlocked. He told me, no, why the hell would I do that? You saw me lock it. We all got out of the car and cautiously approached the front door. As I got closer, I could see a couch not where our couch was with a man in a white tank top sitting there. He was dirty, and he was looking at this boy standing in the corner with such hatred you could tell the boy was abused by the way that he was standing there with his head down. That's when he looked up at me, and it pierces my soul even now just to think about him. The kids were scared, and the dog was growling. I grabbed the doorknob to put my key in. Just then, the music stopped, and the lights went out. We opened the door, and nothing. Nothing had been moved, and no one was there. I couldn't get the image of that sad-looking little boy out of my mind, and it was a while before I saw him again. It was a nice day. My boyfriend and his mother were still at a doctor's appointment, and the kids and I were out grocery shopping, having a good time. I usually kept the living room light on when I knew that we were going to get home after dark. I didn't realize we would be gone that long, and it was just starting to be dusk. I pulled into the gate, and I think the kids were a little too rambunctious. Too much spare change, quarter machine candy, I guess. I sat for a moment, planning my attack with getting all these groceries a sleeping baby, and the two girls up the steps and into the house when I noticed movement in the living room. No one was home. I could hardly even see anything in there because the light wasn't on. I started to get out when the girls jumped out of the car and started running for the steps. I yelled for them to stop and ran over to them. We could hear noises like a child running around, and my eldest daughter to this day says that she saw a little boy and describes him to a T, but at that moment I thought that it might be an intruder or something like that. Three steps went up to a landing, a locked front door opening into a windowed screened-in porch, and then the three French doors. I told the kids to go to the car, but they were too scared to leave my side. Both of them were clutching the back of my shirt. I armed myself with a huge stick by the landing and forged on. I burst through the front door to the porch, and he was there, his face in his two hands cupped against the glass, as if he was peering out, and then he vanished. It was the boy that I had seen standing in the corner before. We went inside and I searched every room with my obviously frightened children practically glued to my side. There was no one there. Was my mind playing tricks on me, and I was projecting my fear onto the girls? I turned on all the lights and ran out to get my sleeping baby and the rest of the groceries out of the car when I stopped in my tracks. There on the glass were two crescent moon handprints, and it was fogged up where his nose was. It stayed there for at least 20 minutes. Just to add my own thoughts here, I don't feel that we always need words to communicate with spirits or for them to get a message to us. They are not bound by flesh. It is important that you have an open mind and always keep your will strong. At night, you could look out the French doors at the stores across the street and see the vast desert behind them. The property was pitch black, so you saw the reflection of yourself and whatever was behind you. That night, everyone was asleep. It was nearly Christmas, so I was admiring the lights decorating the storefronts when I felt one of my children through the floorboards skip up next to me, and then I heard a faint giggle. I felt a tug on my shirt, so I turned my gaze to the reflection extending my arm over as if to caress the back of his head and pull him in next to me. It didn't occur to me that this was not my child. He came in under my arm and stood there looking up at me, and all I could feel was love and sorrow. I turned to look at him, but he was gone. So I looked back at his reflection, and it was gone as well. He was about seven or eight years old. 
He had what looked like black and white Converse on and was wearing old jeans with rolled up cuffs. I could see the edge of a white t-shirt under a light gray sweatshirt and his hair was sandy blonde and wisped to the side with the sweetest smile. In that moment, I felt everything that he was feeling and I cried. I saw the images of abuse flash through my head. I don't want to elaborate on that and he made me feel that the man was not his father and that he loved the comfort of our presence. There were so many emotions. I went to bed and held my kids tight. I was so full of questions like what happened to his mom? How did he die? I looked for records and was told that back in the day there were not many records kept out there in the desert. A person could live and die and no one would know unless it was specifically reported. I felt whatever else was in the house was evil, and we found out just how evil it was the longer that we lived there. I feel I should describe the bedroom so that you can get a feel of the surroundings. On one side of the room there was my full-size bed against the wall and a single bed next to me against the other wall separated by a small nightstand with a lamp where my two little girls slept. The door to the living room was next to their bed, and at our feet was the hall door and closet. Many nights, we would see the light beneath the door get blocked out as if someone were walking up to my room just standing there, and then they would fade away. At first, we thought it was just Opal going to the bathroom since it was right next to our room, but we found out later that it wasn't her because she was frail and had to use a potty chair in her room. The dog would sometimes growl and scratch, but when we opened the door to the hall, no one was ever there. Almost every morning at 6 a.m., we could hear the lid to the toilet slam up and the toilet flush, but when we ran in there, the lid was down and the water was still. A phone would start ringing in my room despite us not even having one, and we would hear old music coming from the walls from time to time. At first, we thought that it was coming from the pipes of our neighbor or something like that, but we didn't have any neighbors because the lady had already moved out and that house was completely empty. So many things happened there, but this night in particular caused me to never let my girls sleep in their own bed alone. The girls were so happy that day. They had both received a package from my mom full of princess stuff, toys, cups, and bowls, two beach towels, and two nightgowns embossed with their favorite princess images. The nightgowns were short and silky, and after their bath, they begged to wear them to bed, so I happily complied. It was quiet in the house that night. Opal was with family along with my boyfriend, and I don't remember where the dog was, but he wasn't present anyway. I tucked them in, oldest by the wall and youngest closest to me on the outside. I wasn't ready for sleep, so I put a scarf over the lamp to dim the light so that I could still read. Now I was sitting on my bed next to them, and as I was reading, the covers slightly came down off of the girls. I didn't really think anything of it because my oldest daughter was notorious for kicking off the blankets, so I tucked them both in and continued reading. It happened again, and once again, I covered them back up. At this point, I was starting to feel uneasy and the hairs on my arms were beginning to raise. Never a good sign. I looked at my oldest daughter and noticed that she hadn't moved. So how was this happening? I sat back down on my bed and pretended to read while intently staring at the covers over the book pages, feeling my heart pound through my chest. Moments passed, and I felt myself trembling, trying to hold the book steady, and then it happened. I saw the covers start to move, but the girls were still. I was confused. I didn't understand what was going on. The covers were then pulled down with force, so I leapt up and grabbed the covers from the end of the bed, pulling them up. At this point, I was standing next to them and my voice quivered as I yelled at whatever was in the room to stay away from my girls. I still don't know who I was yelling at. I sat on the bed next to them, gripping the covers tight when they were jerked from my hands down to the foot of the bed, exposing my girls' legs. My youngest daughter's nightgown started to rise up to the top of her thigh. 
She started to scream and grabbed at her leg as if she were feeling pain, waking her sister. I threw my body over both girls and screamed at whatever it was to get out and leave us alone repeatedly. I tried my best to calm the girls down and protect them. We stayed huddled together all night. This was the last time they slept alone in that house. I was able to get a bigger bed, and we all slept together from that point forward. At this point, I'm sure you're wondering why didn't we just leave? Believe me, I wanted to, but I felt trapped. Not just by the house, but also by my boyfriend. Let me start by saying that Bill was not the nicest man. Oh yeah, from the outside he was great. He had a charming voice, and he made people laugh. Nobody thought that he was capable of doing the things that he did. They didn't know him like I did. I feel he tricked me when we first got together. I was young and impressionable. He knew I had low self-esteem, so he made me feel like I wasn't good enough for anyone else and was lucky to have him. We had children together. I knew what he was capable of, and let's just say that I didn't want to lose anyone I loved, so that's why I didn't leave him. But this was different. This was not him. This was an entirely new level of evil. I started noticing a shift in him the longer that we lived in that house. We stopped going out as a family, and he stopped working. He put bars on the windows and one-way locks on all the doors with only one key. Not even his mother cared. She would go into her bedroom and shut the door so that she didn't have to hear me scream or our children cry when he sometimes hit me. And like always, he made me feel like it was my fault. Living there changed him, though. The things he started to do were out of his character, and that made me more uncomfortable. He started watching me from dark rooms and behind cracks in the doors. When I asked him why he was doing this, he got mad and made me feel like I was crazy. When we were alone together in that house, it was even more intense. One such night, the kids were at my mother's, and we had just finished dinner. We were sitting together on the couch watching TV, and I was mending a sock. It had been a pretty good day. I noticed a change in the atmosphere, and for some reason, he seemed to have gotten quiet. I was just about to ask him if he wanted me to change the channel when a small flash of light hit my right eye. It wasn't until shortly after trying to find the source that I realized he was staring at me the whole time through a little piece of broken mirror in his right hand hidden by the throw cover. My god, those eyes, those eyes weren't his. I know him. This was not my person sitting next to me, and I was frightened to the core. He didn't even realize that I saw this, so I sprung up. His mom just had a phone installed, so I'm trying to call my mother and check on the kids. He jumped and hid the mirror in the couch cushions and started trying to reason with me as to why I should come back and sit down next to him and not make that phone call. I noticed that while he was talking, he wasn't even looking at me. He was looking behind my head, almost as if he were looking through me. I glanced at my reflection in the glass door, but nothing was behind me. I grabbed the phone and called my mother, assuring him that I was only going to be a minute. We stayed on the phone until he fell asleep, and quite a bit longer. My mother knew what was going on, but she felt helpless, as I did at that time. He got up grumbling something as he walked into the bedroom to go to sleep on the bed, so after we hung up, I stayed awake with the blanket on the couch covering everything but my eyes while listening to him breathe until dawn, when I finally fell asleep. There was another time at around 4 p.m. We needed some groceries for dinner, so I got the girls ready and left my baby boy asleep in his playpen in the living room. Opal was napping at the dining room table, and my Bill was sitting on the edge of our bed in the bedroom. I called out to him that I was leaving, and to keep an ear out for the baby, but he didn't respond, so I repeated myself and I heard him mutter, yeah, sure. So we left. The store didn't have something his mother wanted, so I had to go to two stores. It had just gotten dark as we pulled up, and I could hear the baby crying. I rushed in, and Bill's mother was still sitting at the table. I picked up my son and he was soaking wet and it looked like he had been crying for a while. 
I was changing his diaper, trying to calm him down. And the whole time, Opal was getting mad at me for leaving her alone with the baby. I was furious, and I told her, I didn't. I left him with your son. She looked surprised. She didn't even know that he was home. What the hell? Where was he? I put my son down and told the girls to go play. Something wasn't right. I didn't think he was still in the bedroom because the lights were off, but someone was in there. It was abnormally dark. I slowly went up to the door and walked in. There was a dim light coming in through a crack in the blinds, and I saw his silhouette still sitting on the bed. He hadn't moved. His feet were on the floor, and he was slightly hunched forward with his elbows resting on his legs, cupping his hands together. The room smelled stuffy, and the air was thick. I called out his name, but he didn't reply. Once again, I called out his name, adding, You're scaring me. I moved closer, saying, Why are you not answering me? I saw that he was sweating and that it was glistening in the light and dripping from his head to his hands and then his hands to the floor. I could hear it as it dripped. I was shaking while I slowly made my way around him to the lamp and I heard a growl that almost sounded like it was coming up from the floorboards. I turned the lamp on. His shirt was soaking wet. There was a pool of sweat at his feet and his eyes were darker than I've ever seen them. His stare was fixated downward. I was afraid to get near him, but I felt like he needed my help. I started to shake him while calling out his name. He was cold to the touch. I crouched down in front of him between his legs, but honestly, all I wanted to do was run out of that room. I took his face in my shaking hands and said, Please, Bill. Just like that, he snapped out of it. He grabbed both of my wrists and hurled me onto the bed behind him. He said in a loud voice, What are you doing, you freak? Then he got up and went to the bathroom. I heard him turn on the shower as I laid there curled up, not knowing what had just happened. I soon composed myself and went out to bring in the groceries and make dinner. Later he joined us as if nothing had ever happened but I still felt uneasy. The night went on, and he was his old self, goofing off with the kids and watching cartoons. I went into the kitchen and started washing dishes with my back to the hall. I heard him in the living room with the kids. I swear, I heard him. The next thing I knew, he was behind me, and he aggressively grabbed my waist and put his mouth on me. I could feel his teeth on my neck. I jumped. He startled me, then he looked at me like he wanted me dead and said, You disgust me, and left the house. I don't know where he went. I didn't ask. All I know is that he was gone. He came back later that next morning, dirty, and saying something about him getting lost in the desert. I remember him telling me once that I could scream out there and no one would hear me. We eventually got out of that house after living through horror, not knowing from day to day what was going to happen next, and who was safe from that evil. Later, after his mother had moved into her daughter's house, she passed away. I felt bad because I wasn't even sad about it. I found a way to leave Bill. I made an excuse that I needed to pick up a check from the welfare department, and that I had to bring the kids with me. After I got there, I told them that I was being abused, and they helped me find a safe place to go. After I didn't return that day, a detective from the sheriff's department came and asked me questions about him, because apparently, he stole a child and took her to that empty house. Thank God he was caught before he could do anything to her. I never let him hurt my children, but sadly, they remember him hurting me. For years after that, I would have nightmares of him appearing at the foot of my bed, clawing his way up my legs, and closing the space between our faces with his cold breath on my lips and those eyes. I would wake up gasping for air. About nine years ago, I looked up his name and found him on a website exposing predators. I still shiver when I see small mirrors or broken glass. 
A few years after we move out, I ran into the former renter. So I asked her if she knew anything about a little boy ever living there, or did someone die there, and she said, Now this is not fact. She said that she heard, I don't know where though, that there was a boy and his mother disappeared, leaving him with his stepdad, who is horribly abusive. Later, the boy was found stuffed in a hole on the property, dead and they found the stepfather's dried and decayed body on the couch in the living room. He had committed suicide. Like I said, I don't know if that's true, but it seemed pretty damn close to how I felt. I wish even now that I could have helped that sweet little boy move on. We couldn't even drive down that street for years after that, and we all cried with relief many years later when we found out that the house had been demolished to the ground and that a housing tract was being built over the land. I still wonder if those people living there are plagued by the same evil that plagued us. I live in England in a two-story flat, and I have always believed in the paranormal, but my dad does not believe in any type of ghost or anything supernatural. I never thought that this flat was haunted. However, as I got older, I started to feel uncomfortable by myself, and I saw shadows downstairs out of the corner of my eye. Now, there is an attic directly above our second floor, but there is no way for us to enter it, as you cannot access it from this flat. The only way to access this attic is by having a specific key that can open the attic, as it is council flats, which is above my neighbor's house. However, the attic above my flat is the only one which is blocked off, and there is no way to enter it. I have the last flat on the end of these 18 council flats. There are no neighbors above us, just the attic which no one can access without that key, and they would still not be able to get above our flat. One night about two years ago, all of the family was in bed, and it was about three in the morning. All of a sudden, I heard something crash above. It was so loud that it woke all my family members up, and we all got up and stood on the landing together. After that bang, we heard three loud footsteps, and the sound of something being dragged behind these footsteps. It was so scary, as we know that nobody can physically get up there. My dad was not convinced that it was a ghost. He thought that somebody had somehow gotten into the attic, so he went outside to check if the communal attic door was open. I followed him outside, and it was completely padlocked shut with heavy chains around the lock. I tried to explain to him, how can there be anyone up in our part of the attic when it's blocked off and impossible to get into? We came back into the house, and we were all quite shaken up. My brother was young, and was able to get to sleep, but I was awake all night. After this experience, I started to smell old cigarette smoke every time I would enter my toilet, and it was so stale and stagnant. After the event, me, my brother, and my mom were going away on holiday whilst my dad had to stay there and work. He told me he slept with his headphones in every night, as even he felt uncomfortable by himself. As a family, we still have no idea what those noises were, and since then we have heard many strange things. Ten years ago, I was a stupid 18-year-old kid who was living with his parents in Flagstaff, Arizona. We moved almost every three years due to the nature of my dad's work, so I got to see most of the country. It was a Tuesday in November. My mom said that we were packing up the apartment and moving to Seattle for what was going to be another year and two months. I had a small 300cc motorcycle at the time, I think it was a V-Star but I could be wrong, and decided to hook up a GPS and use the time to go on a ride across the west coast. My mother didn't like the idea, but I knew that I would be safe due to personal experience and knowing when and when not to ride. Besides, it would be a three day trip and I would get to see all sorts of neat stuff along the way. I notified my job that I was going to transfer, threw on my saddlebags, and a day later was on the road. 
I made it all the way through western Nevada in order to avoid LA traffic and stopped prior to taking the I-5 into California. That evening I stayed in a Days Inn hotel. After breakfast and a talk with the locals, I crossed through Reno into western Cali. From there, it was only four more hours until I reached Oregon. Luckily, I had time to spare, so I wanted to take some back roads and discover what this dank, damp state had to offer. It was fall, and there was a deep chill in the air. Riding through it sent shivers down my spine like nothing else. November's weather in Oregon is almost identical to that of Pittsburgh during that season. It makes you want to curl up into a ball and sleep for a decade, only to wake up and repeat the process all over again. Eventually, I got tired enough that I wanted to find somewhere to stay, and managed to see a sign advertising a Green Hills Hunting Lodge on the side of the road. It was accompanied by a long, steep hill that took me what felt like an hour to climb. Then, when I reached the top, I was greeted by a large and gorgeous cabin that looked like it was specifically made for weddings, like something ripped out of a fairy tale. Bewildered, I parked my bike, took off my bags, and threw a tarp over it, which was secured to bungee cords. I walked inside and met a Korean woman who was working the front desk. She spoke perfect English, but had a very distinct accent in which she explained to me that I could choose my room due to an abundance of vacancy. Cool, right? I chose room 31, as the entire building was all on one floor that evening. She handed me a key with the tag 31 attached via a key ring and tells me to have a good night. I throw all my stuff down and head to the bathroom to wash up after riding for an entire day. The room itself looks like a cabin and is absolutely gorgeous. The floorboards were all real wood, and even the shower had the same natural wood as the tub surrounding it. I take a shower and then head to bed and realize that the mattress is incredibly comfortable and make myself cozy, only to realize that something is off. It's not something obvious, but I knew that there was some sort of oddity about this place. I push it to the back of my mind and fall asleep. The next morning, I wake up to find that the walls went from a natural brown to a deeper gray, as if they were stained overnight. This wasn't a result of natural lighting versus LED. The room was without a doubt a different color. I shrug it off and get all my stuff together, making sure that everything is still where I left it. I head out of the room to find that not only had the walls changed color, I was on a second floor that previously didn't exist. The light from the morning sun wasn't permeating the windows of the cabin, and there was no one in sight. I started to freak out, nearly having a panic attack because this wasn't right. Thankfully, there were stairs that I dashed down as fast as I could and made my way to the front desk and rang the bell once, twice, three times. I was breathing heavy and knew that I had to get out of there. No one was coming to check up on me after about 10 minutes of waiting, so I dashed out of the doors and into the lot. I ripped the tarp off of my bike and looked back at the lodge. It wasn't the same. This was a broken down, abandoned, dirty building that looked as though it was about to be condemned. I didn't want to ask any more questions and rode off as fast as I could. That place still haunts me, even to this day. I have an attic in my house, and ever since I was young, I hated going up there. It was dark, because there was no light, and it was always absolutely freezing. It had a really bad energy, and my anxiety would skyrocket whenever I had to go up there with my dad. It felt like someone had set a timer, and time was running out, if that makes sense. It was like I had to get out of there ASAP, or something would happen. In 2016, my parents decided to convert the attic and make it into their bedroom. After this happened, I noticed a lot of unexplainable events. One day, I was off from school and I was home alone. I was lying on my bed watching Jeremy Kyle show clips with both of my cats on the bed with me. Then I heard what sounded like someone walking down the stairs from the attic. It's a very distinct sound, and I knew it was the stairs creaking as they were new and didn't normally make any noise. I paused the video and listened. 
I didn't hear anything, so I continued watching, now a little on edge. Two minutes later, I heard the footsteps again. Peanut, my cat, started hissing and meowing and went to the end of my bed and hid. At this point, I was tearing up. I somehow managed to get out of bed and pull my dresser in front of my door. I sat in front of the door and called my dad, sobbing. I explained to him what was happening and he said, Go out of my room and look. Hell no. I begged him to call my neighbors to come in and get me. It was only after I called my dad five times, he kept hanging up on me, that he called my neighbors. One of my neighbors, who have a key, came in. I flew down the stairs, sobbing and shaking. My neighbor checked the house, but no one was there. I didn't feel safe staying home for weeks after this. My best friend and I would hang out after school at my house most days, and whenever we did, we would always hear noises from upstairs. One time in particular, we were in the kitchen making noodles, and we heard banging. I assumed it was my cat and didn't think much of it. My friend then shushed me and said to listen. From upstairs, I could hear the sound of someone opening and closing a chest of drawers and slamming my wardrobe open and shut. Now my cats are loud, but how on earth does a cat open up a drawer? It's a very distinct sound. We ended up waiting in my back garden holding a paint scraper and a knife until my dad came home. This is by far one of the scariest ones. My dad called up the stairs to me and said he was going to the shops. Once he left, I went downstairs to grab some food. I asked my sister if she wanted anything to eat, and she said yes. She was in the front room, so I was talking to her from the kitchen. My dad knocked on the door, and I yelled at her to get it. She didn't. I went to answer it, giving it to her for being lazy. When I opened the door, in came my dad and my sister. After months of noises, banging, hearing people talking and walking around when I was home alone, I was sick of it. I felt anxious to be in my own home, and I had other things to worry about. So one day I decided to try to talk to whatever it was that was in my house. I didn't use a Ouija board. I just sat on my stairs and had a chat, I guess. I told him that I respect that they were in this house before I was, but that they were scaring me and stressing me out. I asked if they would be able to leave or at least stop frightening me. After this, I've never had anything happen in my house. No banging or noises. I think that it was the spirits of the previous owners, a nice elderly couple who sadly died in the house of natural causes. About five years ago, I had just moved into a new house with my wife at the time. We had two kids, ages two and a half and one. My two and a half year old was very articulate for his age. And so one day as we were walking out the front door, he points across the house and asks, Mommy, who's that little girl right there? Well, my wife and I just kind of froze because he was the kind of kid that had never made up any imaginary friends or anything like that. But the moment passed and we kind of forgot about it. Around six to eight months later, I remember I was in my bedroom late at night. I have a large window in my bedroom that looks out into my backyard. I also had a couple strings of lights overhead that illuminated the yard perfectly. One night I was up studying for a class the next day when I looked outside and saw that my kid's swing set had one swing going back and forth in a perfect pendulum motion like someone was on it, while the swing next to it was dead still. This was not the first time this has happened. It was actually the third, I think. But it was the instance that I remember the most clearly and took the most notice. I honestly have no idea why I didn't think to tell my wife or to take a video, but I just stood there in the window and watched it for a couple minutes and it kept up perfect consistency. I grabbed my flashlight and walked out to my deck to get a better look. Still swinging. I had been studying lots of science classes at that point, so my head was in the space of, I'm going to figure out the rational explanation of why this is happening. 
It was breezy out, so I walked up to the swing set and held my hand in different places around the swinging swing and no breeze. Plus, again, the swing next to it was dead still. Also, my thought was that if it was the wind, there was no way that it could keep a perfect back and forth motion. If a swing gets even a little off, it would have collided with the one next to it. Anyway, I'm not sure if I had a previous encounter with my son in mind or not, but I had a very certain feeling at that moment that there was a little girl swinging on the swing. Almost like I could see her, but obviously couldn't. I also felt very at ease and not frightened at all. Then after about five to ten minutes, I stopped the swing just to see what would happen, and it remained stopped. I remembered apologizing out loud to the girl for stopping the swing, and told her that she could swing whenever she wanted to, but it never happened again after that, and I haven't had any additional encounters at this house since. I looked up public records and asked the landlord if there was ever any little girl that had died in this house, and nothing. The only info that I could collect is that a few years before we moved in, there was an elderly woman who lived here for about 20 years, but the owner had the landlord kick her out in fear that she would die on the property, so she had to move in with family a few states away. Anyways, I would love to hear your thoughts on this one. I first discovered the Ouija board when I was 14. A girl was visiting from America, I'm in the UK, and she told us how to talk to ghosts. Eight of us went to her house and made a board with ripped bits of paper and a turned wine glass. Four of us would put our fingers on the glass and we would swap someone out every so often. This way we believed that it would eliminate anyone who might be pushing the glass. I'll add here that the finger that had been in the glass always felt cold afterward. Don't know if others have noticed this. The first few days were spent asking silly questions like, does so-and-so fancy me, or who will I marry, etc. On the third day, things took a darker turn, and we started getting responses told to us without asking. It started saying things like, so-and-so will get run over, and X will die of cancer and other really freaky shit. This scared us, and we stopped playing. Years later, in my early 20s, I shared a flat with my brother and boyfriend at the time, and bored one night we decided to do a Ouija board. So we made a board, as I had when I was younger, and set to it. It didn't take long for the glass to move, and we asked who it was, where they came from, and how they had died. It told us its name was Bill. He was an old hippie, and he had died from an overdose. Anyhow, things went on for a while, then my boyfriend, who was convinced that we were the ones pushing the glass, said if there's really a ghost here, prove it. I kid you not, not a second later, the lights went out. At that time, I had one of those old-fashioned meters that you had to put money in, so after my initial shock, I reasoned that I needed to put a coin in the meter and stood up to do it. But before I got to the door, the lights came back on. Somewhat spooked, I sat back down and me and my brother put our fingers back on the glass. My boyfriend point blank refused. The glass then spelled out, chilly trick, hey. After that, it kept going in circles and moving toward me, so I decided that enough was enough and said goodbye. A few years ago after Facebook started and I got back in touch with my old school friends, I heard that one of them had died of cancer in his late teens. Not sure about the other prophecy, but I know that I'll never do a Ouija board again, and I firmly believe that we do tap into forces beyond our five senses. A couple of years ago, me and my pops decided to go on a road trip. It was very out of the blue. I wasn't even expecting it, but I decided to go anyways. It would be some solid father-son bonding time. 
After driving for what seemed like a couple of hours, it was around maybe 8 to 9 p.m., we pulled into this gas station for snacks, water, and to use the bathroom, and we went back inside of our car. Keep in mind, this gas station was basically in the middle of nowhere. Anyways, we got back into our car and decided to look for a motel, but there was none. And I mean not a single one anywhere near us. My dad was really tired, so we just decided to go to sleep in the vehicle. We pulled up into this sort of resting area slash parking lot and decided to pass out for the night. My dad fell fast asleep, but I was on my phone for a couple more hours, and around 11 p.m. I just felt suffocated by the tense air and decided to step out for a bit. I felt safe because the gas station was still in sight, and there would be a couple of trucks that would occasionally drive by, so I was at ease. At the time, I was also texting my friend who lives in Seattle, Washington. We were on the phone for a little while. Then I saw what looked like a large cornfield, and I had never actually seen a cornfield in real life, so I decided to cross the road and just get a closer look. That's exactly what I did. I got extremely close, and I started feeling like I was being watched, but again I just thought, well, you're literally outside in the dark, standing next to a tall cornfield, of course you're going to feel this way. So I just brushed it off. I even considered going in, but I thought, why would I even do that? So anyways, I just decided to take a step back when I noticed a barn. It was a large, white barn with red, maybe black stripes. It was hard to tell in the dark, but it was definitely a barn. I was stupid and young when this happened, maybe 14 or 15. Out of curiosity, I decided to go check it out, and the barn was next to the cornfield, sort of tucked in a little. I literally thought, haha, I wish I could see something that would freak me out as a joke because I never really thought that anything would happen and I love being scared. Anyways, I started making my way toward the barn. As I was getting closer and closer, I remembered very vividly that I was wearing no socks, just slip on slides. I remember the dirt rubbing against my toes as I stepped. I remember sending pictures to my friend in Washington. I jokingly was saying that I saw something and that I was going to check it out. As I got closer, I saw something. It was behind the barn, but sort of off to the side, like how when someone peers around a corner. I thought it was a bell. Literally, I assumed that it was a bell attached to the corner of the barn, so I just walked a little closer. Even as I'm writing this, I am getting goosebumps. I walked closer and saw the head of someone or something just peering around the corner at me. At that moment, I just straight up froze. My fight or flight was out of function because there I was literally seeing someone or something peering at me. After about five to 10 seconds, the noise that Snapchat makes when you get a notification snapped me out of it. And I just ran as fast as I could across the road to my dad's car and got in. I felt a sense of relief wash over my body. Somehow my dad was not awake. Me gasping for air wasn't enough to wake him from his deep sleep. I really considered waking him up and telling him what I saw and that we had to leave, but he would just assume that I was joking or having an episode. Which sounds dumb, but he's assumed that before, since he never has believed in anything paranormal or anything out of the ordinary related. I took deep breaths and just texted my friend telling her what I saw and even she didn't believe me. I don't blame her. And I wouldn't blame any of you either. Sometimes I have a hard time actually believing what I saw, but I know that it was real. I was sober and fully aware. But from the bottom of my heart, the part that disturbs me the most is that whatever was peering at me from around that corner was very tall. At least seven, maybe eight feet tall. And every time I think about this, I get a sense of dread and paranoia. I haven't told any of my family or my dad, but if any of you have a clue as to what I might have seen, please let me know. Again, I wasn't hallucinating. This was before I even figured out anything about psychedelics or drugs in general. Please let me know if you have any ideas or info. Also, it probably sounds fake because if someone came to me telling me what I'm saying, I would also just rule it out to be fake. But please. I've been trying to piece it together for the last couple of months. I was sort of 50-50 on paranormal encounters, but after that experience, I believe. I believe in walkers to Wendigos. I believe in ghosts to La Llorona. 
It has changed me, knowing what's out there. And everyone wants to believe, oh yeah, ghosts aren't real. But I feel like they are, deep down. We know that there is some messed up stuff out there in this world. And I happened to encounter something. This is the story of the time I saw an apparition that looked as if it crept right off the silver screen. This encounter happened in the late summer, early fall of 2007. I was in the fourth grade and my family had just moved to the absolute boonies of Mississippi. I was born in Mississippi and still had a lot of family down there, but my father had been stationed in another state for the previous several years. Military. So I guess you could say we were moving back home. My parents were in the market to buy a house, but until they found one, we would be staying with my great aunt and her family. My aunt had a beautiful but slightly run down 100 and something year old home in the woods on the outskirts of an abominably small town. In order to get to her home, you had to drive down a one lane dirt road through the woods. On this particular afternoon, my sisters and my cousin, who is about our age, were playing tag in the front yard of my aunt's home. Now, you need to know a little bit about the layout of this yard. The yard was longer than it was wide. Picture a rectangle with the house on one end and the dirt roadway at the other end of it. If you're looking at the house from the road, the right side of the yard is bordered by muddy soil, thick trees, and bamboo that creates a sort of natural border to the property. On the other side of the yard is a length of tropical leafy bushes about waist high that run from the front of the porch almost down to the road separating the yard from the driveway, just on the other side of the plants. Near the road in the middle of the yard was a ginormous old oak tree dripping with Spanish moss. Now back to the game. This particular round of tag, I was it. My siblings and cousin were running around the yard in the house, trying to hide behind various things. As I was scanning the yard, I noticed a figure of a girl with long, straight brown hair peeping her head out from behind the big oak tree. She was wearing a dress that fell below her knees, which was very different from what the rest of us kids were wearing, namely cut-off jean shorts and stained t-shirts. I thought it was odd to see someone there, since I could have sworn that I saw all of the girls run in the opposite direction toward the house, but I figured I would go and check it out anyway. As I made it to the tree, I looked behind the trunk, and there was no one there. I was beyond confused at this point. My ten-year-old brain didn't immediately jump to ghost. It was more along the lines of, Who the heck was that? The tree was in the center of the yard, with no other trees or shrubbery within twenty or so yards. So if the girl would have run up from behind the tree, I should have seen her. By that point, I started scanning the yard, and my eyes happened to fall to those tropical bushes that bordered the driveway. Crouching down near the bushes was the same figure of the girl. I remember her squatting near the leaves and peering in my direction when I noticed that she had no face. She was completely absent of any facial features, eyes, lips, and nose. Her face was just a smooth expanse of flesh-colored skin. It looked like something straight out of Silent Hill. I must have looked away, and then she was gone. I have never seen this apparition since. Now, I honest to goodness recall this encounter just as I have described above, but it was also 14 years ago. It's quite possible that my memory has faltered in some aspects or as exaggerated in others, but this is how I recall it. Either way, it was terrifying. In 2017, my girlfriend and I moved into a tiny, kind of crappy house in our college town. The house was made by a couple of students a few years prior, so the architecture was a bit sloppy. 
For example, the roof was flat. Take note of this because it'll be important later. However, the house was really cheap and close to campus, so it seemed like a total steal. The first couple months living there, nothing out of the ordinary happened, but it wasn't too long before we began experiencing strange paranormal activities. The first odd occurrence was with our smoke detectors. Our smoke detectors would go off constantly. It was strange because they would go off even if there wasn't smoke in the house from our bad cooking, for example. We thought that maybe it was because of old batteries, but no matter how many times we changed them, it never made a difference. It got to the point where they were going off three to five times a day, and at that, we just broke down and took the batteries out of them altogether. Note, there were six detectors in total. However, even without the batteries, the detectors were still going off. So out of desperation, we turned off the entire smoke detector circuit to the house. It was at this point when things started getting really out of control. The back room slash storage room in the house always had a really eerie feeling, like someone was watching you or standing just behind you staring down at you. Thankfully, me and my girlfriend's bedroom was the furthest room in the house away from the storage area, so I avoided it like the plague. Anyways, one night around 3 a.m., the smoke detector in our bedroom goes off. However, it's not the usual repetitive beeping, it's a single, long beep. It sounded like when someone holds the test button on a detector. Frustrated, my girlfriend grabs a chair from the dining room and stands on it to reach the detector, but moments before she touches it, the beeping stops. We both groan in irritation as she goes to put the chair back, but before she makes it to the dining room, the detector down the hallway from our room makes the same continuous beep. Just like before, she stands on the chair to reach the detector, but right before grabbing it, it stops. Our smoke detectors continued this pattern all the way back to the creepy storage room. This happened two more times that night. It was as if whatever was messing with us was trying to lead us to its space. This would happen to us at least once or twice a week for the next year and a half that we lived there. Shortly after the encounters with the smoke detectors, the house became absolutely infested with bugs. There was no history of bug issues when we bought the home, and it started almost immediately after our first experience with the detectors. Bugs would pour out of light fixtures, small cracks in the walls, counters, and of course, the smoke detectors. Literally one minute everything would be fine, and then the next, winged insects or ants would pour out of the walls. We had multiple exterminators come, but less than a week after treating the house, the bugs would be back, just as bad as before. It made us miserable, and I've never seen an infestation to that extreme. It was absolutely unnatural. After these events, we began feeling really terrified and depressed. We both hated being home, but there was no other place for us to go. This was when the footsteps started. Remember how I said our roof was flat? At least a few times a week, we would hear large, heavy, possibly hoof-like footsteps on the roof. We tried writing it off as being animals, so whenever we heard the steps, we would run outside to see if we could spot whatever the animal was. But there was never anything there. The steps were very far apart from one another. Whatever was walking on our roof would start from the creepy storage room and in maybe three or four steps, walk to our bedroom. The steps were so loud that it sounded like whatever was haunting us was either very big or stomping to get our attention. Now began the phantom sounds. We had large metal bowls that we used for daily cooking, so when we were done, we would wash them and set them on the counter to dry. The first time it happened, me and my girlfriend were sitting on the couch in the living room. The kitchen was right next to the living room, but there was an island that blocked our view to the sink area. Anyways, on this night, we were startled by the sound of our multiple metal bowls being thrown off of the counter. At this time, we didn't have pets, so we assumed the worst and thought that someone might be breaking into the house. 
We both shot up and ran over to face our worst fear, but not only was no one in the house, nothing in the kitchen had been moved. The bowls were still on the counter, just where we left them. This was the most common paranormal occurrence in the house, and it happened at least five to ten times a day at all hours. After a while, we were so sick and tired of these disturbances that we stopped using our metal bowls, or if we did use them, we would hand dry them and put them away right after use. This didn't make the spirit very happy, so next, we started hearing what sounded like our ceramic plates being thrown to the ground, and our kitchen cabinets slamming over and over again. Do you know those types of cabinet hinges that close slowly? Yeah, that's what we had. So, to slam the cabinets like that, they would have had to have been closed with excessive force. The next phase in our haunting was sightings and photographs. The phone I had at the time had one of those automatic face tracking features, meaning that when you would take pics on my phone, the yellow boxes would appear around the person's face to focus on them. One night I was taking a picture in me and my girlfriend's bedroom when a yellow face tracker square appeared at the foot of our bed, way above our bed. If that was a person, they would have had to have been at least seven feet tall. At the time, we did have posters on our bedroom walls, so while focusing on the face tracker square, I circled the room to confirm that the tracker wasn't just focusing on one of them by accident. To my dismay, no matter where I was in the room, or from what angle, the square stayed in the exact same place. Oh yeah, even better, I was home alone for a few nights. I don't think I've ever experienced such sheer terror as I did when I went to sleep that night. After this first encounter, having cameras track faces in our pictures became a constant occurrence all throughout the house. The final phase of our haunting before getting the heck out of there was physical encounters. This happened more often to my girlfriend than me, but something would occasionally grab and pull our hair, especially when we were walking through the living room. But the most terrifying experience goes to our friend Jamie. She came to visit us for a few nights, and while she was there, she would sleep on our couch. She was aware of all the paranormal encounters in the house, and she had seen most of them firsthand, but nothing compared to what was about to happen. It was around three in the morning when she woke up with an eerie, uncomfortable feeling. All of a sudden, she experienced what felt like someone or something stepping up onto the couch. It stepped both of its feet up, one on either side of her body. Starting from her feet, it slowly walked up the length of her body until it felt like two feet were on either side of her head. She said she felt an intense, malevolent energy staring down at her, but she was too terrified to open her eyes. Meanwhile, the cabinets in the kitchen began to slam over and over. For the next few hours, she pretended to be asleep all the while this presence was standing over her. She told me she's not exactly sure when it went away, because she eventually became so exhausted that she did fall back asleep. Not too long after this experience, we were finally able to sell the house and get the heck out. We lost tons of money because we sold it for way less than we had originally paid. I can't help but feel bad for the person who bought the home, but it's been almost three years and she's still living there. I think the takeaway from this story is if a house is priced too good to be true, then it is. Back in the mid-80s, we were traveling through Tennessee on the way to visit friends in Texas. Mom was driving, and I, a teenager at the time, was navigating by using a paper map, as these were the days before cell phones and GPS. We made it past Nashville on I-40 pretty late at night. We were maybe an hour outside the city. I was charting our progress old school with pencil and paper. We pass an exit, I mark it. A minute later, a summer thunderstorm hit. 
Visibility dropped to nothing. All traffic slows to a crawl, and we decide to pull off at the next possible exit and find a motel to spend the night, because there's no way that we're making significant progress in this storm. Slow, white-knuckle driving ensues. An exit looms up on the right, no signage that we can see in the downpour, and we take it. At the top of the exit ramp, we turn right toward a brilliantly lit up gas station. It was a left turn onto an overpass crossing I-40 with no lights from that side of the interstate. We were on a dinky little road at that point. To our right, there was a gas station which we're rapidly passing. To our left and back behind some trees was what appeared to be a motel, but you couldn't make out the sign well in the rain. We drove past the gas station before we really realized that the road just ended ahead. The gas station was the only building on this side of the road. It went from a one and a half lane that was paved to a one lane gravel road we could see a short way ahead to tire track dirt and grass all over the space of maybe 20 yards. Now, we were past this gas station, and there was only one turnoff from this road. It was on our left. We took it and tried to back up and turn around to get back to the gas station. Unfortunately, the paved slope of that narrow, driveway-sized turnoff led steeply down into a huge mud pit. No backing up out of it. My mom put the car into low gear, turned hard, and headed back for the gravel road through the mud. We almost made it, but got mired out. The front passenger tire caught on the corner of an exposed concrete storm drain, maybe three feet from the road. Out of the car, into the rain and mud. We walked to the gas station. The place was spotless, super bright, and had two young men behind the counter. What sounded like one of Elvis's songs was playing on their radio inside. Attendant's first words on seeing us walk in were, Did you get stuck in the mud? They said it as a super enthusiastic, way too happy greeting. Like Disney staffer welcoming you as you walk into the park for the first time levels of happy. Also, these night shift clerks were dressed in suits that looked about 30 years out of date. The place was kind of creepy. We admitted that we had indeed gotten stuck. We asked if there was a towing company that we could call. They pulled out a phone book. Again, this was before cell phones or the internet, and started talking to each other. It was not a Nashville phone book, some little township. Population couldn't have been more than a hundred from the handful of white pages, but the book had dozens of yellow pages of nothing but tow truck companies. Like literally hundreds of tow truck companies for this town too small to appear on the map. The attendants had a friendly debate about whose turn it was to get a car out of the mud. They decided to skip over the company who was theoretically next because there had been some sort of problem with them the last time that they were called out for a tow. They made a decision on who to call and let my mom use their phone. More weirdness, and the creepiness intensifies. It was still storming, though less at that point. The truck arrives maybe five minutes later. Brilliant white. Not a speck of dirt or a drop of mud on it. I've seen vehicles in a new car lot that were dirtier. The two young men in the truck are also dressed like they had just stepped out of the 1950s. They were wearing freshly polished patent leather shoes without a drop of mud on them along with starched white shirts, paper hats, and bow ties. We hike across the street next door to the mud pit where our car is stuck. The tow truck guys are horrified. They almost got out of the mud, they say to each other repeatedly. The subtext from their shocked tone is clear. No one must ever, ever escape the mud pit on their own. These people will have to take some sort of action to make sure that no one else gets as close as we did to escaping. They tow the car out. Easy peasy. We all go back to the gas station. We pay the tow truck drivers for services. The drivers let the gas station attendants know that my mom and I almost made it out of the mud on our own. The attendants, again, are horrified and shocked by this. By now, we're getting huge, uncanny valley vibes from all four of these men. And not just them, the whole place is too clean, too brightly lit, and too weirdly out of date. It was a surprisingly good facsimile of a small town rest stop populated by real humans. Almost perfect, in fact. We are definitely in creepy town. If these guys were humans, there was seriously something off about them. 
If they weren't, they almost had their ordinary human act down pat. The truck drivers leave. The attendants turn, all super friendly again, and ask Mom and me if we're going to stay the night in the hotel across the road. They're so excited that we might spend the night here. They talk about how great it is. Mom and I make non-committal noises and return to the car. I tell Mom, we're not staying here tonight. She agrees wholeheartedly. The rain is finally letting up. We drive down I-40 to the very next exit. It was maybe five miles. We pull off and spend the night in a kind of crappy but ordinary motel. At least it's not the Bates Motel, we joke. The rest of the trip goes well. Then, several days later on the way home, Mom and I decide that we would really like to see the creepy town in the light of day. It couldn't have been that weird, could it? Heading back up I-40, we pass the exit where we actually did spend the night on the way down. We can see the hotel, the exit number matches the notes that I had made on the map, everything. Then we start looking for the next exit. The exit to Creepy Town. Should be about five miles along with an overpass. Five miles pass. No exit. No overpass. Five more miles later before we find the next exit off of I-40. It's the one that I had marked as being right before the storm first hit. In short, Creepy Town does not exist. I have traveled I-40 many times since, often remarking that, hey, there's that exit where the weird storm hit and we went to Creepy Town, and there's the exit that we actually did spend the night at. We never found the Creepy Town exit between those two points ever again. This story took place when I was a kid. My dad has been a pool man for many years. One of his oldest customers decided to purchase a ranch. I don't exactly remember where. He asked my dad if he could come and fix their pool, which was disastrously maintained before he bought it. He gave my dad permission to bring us along and told us that we were welcome to stay a few days to enjoy the ranch. We drove there, and I had been in charge of reading the MapQuest instructions because I never seemed to be able to sleep during car trips. We drove back home a few days later, after my dad was finally able to save the pool. The drive home was very long. For endless stretches, the view was mostly desert, farms, and the occasional small suburban town. Unlike me, my mom and brothers were knocked out almost immediately. So, most of the trip, it was just my dad and I talking or listening to music. I'm also a very avid reader, so I had a book on my lap beside the maps. I remember the ride had been quiet for a while, because I had been reading. I had to stop because it was getting dark, and my dad would only let me turn on the dome lights to read the maps. No radio service, and the Game Boy batteries had all died. All I had left to do was stare out the window. All of a sudden, I spotted a very tall shadow on a roof. I realized that there was a man who seemed to be wearing a hat, bowler or top hat, dancing and jumping from rooftop to rooftop of this suburban lot. It was kind of like the scene from Singing in the Rain, which, at that point, I had not yet seen myself. It took a second for me to realize that this was not a normal thing to observe. The houses were separated in a way where a normal person couldn't possibly have jumped from roof to roof the way that that thing was. What scared me the most is how at the last house before a field he seemed to turn around and sense me. He bowed and tipped his hat. Even though I couldn't see it, I could also sense that he was smiling. All I felt was dread. I turned to my dad to see if he had also seen it but he had, of course, been paying attention to the road. When I looked back, I couldn't see the houses anymore. They were way behind us. I never saw a face or any details. He was just a silhouette on the roofs. I remember the feeling of being afraid that it would follow us. That it could, if it wanted to. I never saw something like that on our many road trips ever again. Sometimes I wonder if I imagined it, but it felt so real. 
The memory is so vivid as well, which always comes back when I'm watching old musicals because the dancing reminds me of the way that he moved. I was born a twin, but my twin sister died at birth. So did all six children my parents had after me. Those died pretty early into the pregnancy, so it was mostly miscarriages. My twin was the only one who took a few breaths before passing. I'm the only one who survived and grew up to be the adult I am today. I only lived in one house during my entire lifetime, until recently when I got to finally move out. There's good reason for that. I learned about my siblings, especially my twin sister, when I was 14 years old. But when I was a first grader, I would wholeheartedly believe that I wasn't an only child, and tell my teachers and the other children about my sister who I was playing with and sharing a room with. By the way, I don't have actual memories of this, because no one was there. But I didn't lie for attention. I genuinely believed that. I had a fair share of trauma and mental illnesses in my life already, so when I started to hallucinate disfigured shadows and children in my house at age 12, I went to see a therapist, and it was deemed a symptom of my PTSD. The shadows would form a kind of uncanny young girl's shape most of the time. Until recently, I just discovered these hallucinations were side effects of my admittedly fragile mental state, since the encounters really scared me. Sometimes it even felt like it would talk to me in a weird, unfriendly way. They stopped at the age of 14, when my mother finally told me about my siblings but still on the staircase to my room and around the dinner table where those things appeared, I would feel watched or even chased, especially at night. Sometimes when I'm awake late, I hear footsteps up the stairs to my room, but they just stop in front of the last step and don't go back down, but seem to start from the bottom again a few minutes later. This changed when I got together with my boyfriend he started sleeping over and spending more time at the house, naturally, and I never told him about my scary encounters. So when we were still up at night and the footsteps occurred, which I had learned to ignore quite well, he looked up from his phone screen, clearly alerted, and my stomach dropped. He's a skeptic, so after he mentioned how the sounds were weird, he quickly got his mind off of it. A few weeks later, my boyfriend went to the bathroom at night. In the morning, he told me how weird he felt walking up the stairs. He felt like someone was watching or chasing him. I never told him about how I always felt this exact thing when I walk up those stairs. Those occurrences with him started piling up until I got genuinely terrified of staying longer than necessary in that godforsaken house. Right after I turned 18 earlier this year, I started working my hardest to afford to move out. And I finally did it last week. So far, I haven't had scary encounters in my new home. Something is telling me that it was her the whole time. Since I was a child, she's been tormenting me. The way my skeptic boyfriend experienced it, the same exact way without knowing convinced me. I am not crazy. My mom and I moved into a house when I was in the fifth grade. For the record, I'm 25 now. And there was a room in the attic that looked like it was actually built to be part of the house and not some makeshift DIY room. The attic was also not your typical attic with a pull-down door, but a walk-through door. Anyway, the layout was that it made an L shape, an all wooden, and the room was obvious at the end of the L. We used the attic for Christmas decorations and whatnot. But anyhow, on with the story. I turned the room into my little hangout area. 
The only thing in there when we moved in was a wooden table with four chairs and then some weird bench that I hear was a bed, but it didn't look big enough. So me and my friends would always go in there to hang out, play games, and whatnot. Well, one day, I accidentally broke the table and was worried that my mom was going to be mad at me. I don't think she would have cared since the stuff was so old. But out of fear, I just grabbed all the stuff that I owned and left the room, closing the door behind me. I think I remember once going back in there a few years later, like ninth grade maybe, but never actually spent an extended period of time. I would always stack the Christmas decorations in front of the wall and door to it. The year before we moved, we decided to move everything into the garage after Christmas for my senior year in high school. That way we didn't have to deal with it when the movers showed up. We never used the garage anyway, but got rid of lots of stuff the year prior, so we had plenty of room. That was the last official time I saw the door. But the absolute last time I stepped foot in that house, the stuff was all packed away, on the truck preparing to leave, and I was doing one last walkthrough when I decided to go into that room and make sure that I didn't forget anything and leave it behind. I went to go to the attic, and it was missing. Nothing but a blank wall. Like there was no way a room could have ever even have been there. I was shocked and asked my mom, but she had no idea. I even called my friends to verify, and yeah, they all remembered the room, but she didn't. It was odd. Very odd. I never felt anything weird about the room at all, like, I'm pretty sensitive to paranormal stuff, and this just seemed like some random room. The house, in my opinion, was haunted because a guy hung himself in the living room, but I don't believe that that was connected. I was a senior in high school, and I always hung out with my sister, who was five years older than me, and her friends. That night it was us siblings, her best friend H, who was the same age as my sister, and our friend G, who was about 20 and enlisted in the army. We thought it would be a great idea, since it was close to Halloween, to play with a Ouija board for the first time. We got a Ouija board and decided to turn off all the lights in the house and light a few candles to really set the mood. So we sat in the floor of the living room and started our little game. I was sitting between H and G, across from my sister. It took a while, but we finally got a response when G asked if anyone was there. The planchette slid to yes. We kinda giggled because we thought it was one of us. But then it started spelling out Mama. My sister and I immediately go pale and make eye contact across the board. Our grandmother had passed away next door, about a year prior to this. Before we could ask another question, the planchette spelled out the word love. We still weren't convinced. A little spooked, but not scared. G then asked the board, how many children do you have? And the planchette slid to the number two, which is the correct number of kids that our grandmother had. It's important to know that G and H didn't know very much about our grandmother. They came into our lives after our grandmother had passed, so they never met her. The planchette then spelled out the words, Roll Tide. Now we live in Alabama, and my grandmother was the biggest Alabama football fan. She would watch every game. The Alabama football catchphrase is, Roll Tide. My sister and I immediately begin crying because it just seems so unreal. And then the planchette starts moving again. This time it's sliding around and going to the word goodbye. I ask, do you want us to stop playing? And the planchette quickly slides to yes. My sister doesn't want to stop. She asks, but why? We want to ask you more questions. And the planchette quickly moves across the board to spell out the word bad. That was more than enough for me. I felt like if this was my mama, and she was telling us to stop playing, maybe we should take her advice and quit while we were ahead. She said bad. Did that mean that something bad would happen? Or that doing that was bad? With the Ouija board. I don't want to find out. But after trying to convince my sister and friends, it did no good. The planchette keeps circling the board and going back to goodbye over and over again. 
Finally, everyone says goodbye because it's clear that nothing else was going to be discussed. But then, for some reason, I was talked into participating again. This time, when something answered us back, the planchette moved across the board even faster. But it was between two letters only. Z-O-Z-O-Z-O. -O -O -O. And that's all it would say. I don't know what the others felt, because we really didn't talk about it much. But to me, it felt like the room became colder. It was then unanimous that we did decide to say goodbye. We were shaking. Whatever we had just spoken to didn't feel right. My sister and I decided to sleep in the same bed. I remember lying in bed and being huddled together and just looking around the room. Every sound made me jump. I swear, I could see dark humanoid figures all around. Maybe it was paranoia, but I definitely did not sleep at all that night. I kept thinking about how Mama or whatever was imitating her had said bad like it was a warning. My sister ended up getting rid of the board shortly after. I'm not sure what she did with it. I know her and some other friends tried to play with it again in a very old graveyard near our house with graves that dated back to the 1800s. While they were playing, they heard what sounded like footsteps in the woods around the graveyard and what sounded like scraping on one of the headstones. I don't plan on touching another Ouija board again. I have a few stories that I can't explain, but this is the one that I feel I need to share because it happens to align with a type of experience that so many people have reported throughout the years, arguably since ancient times. I'd always been certain of what I saw, but when I first became aware of shadow people as a commonly reported phenomena, any doubt that I had about the incident disappeared. So many people have tried to tell me that what I experienced was just a dream or simply brushed it off with that look that says this guy is either nuts or lying. And honestly, it's time that people start taking victims of paranormal visitation at their word. In an age where we're starting to wake up to the fact that victims of all forms of abuse deserve a voice and representation, it's sad to see that so many people are disregarded as mentally ill or confused just because their experience lacks an accredited scientific explanation. My experience was not as extreme as some that I've heard from others on various paranormal forums and podcasts, but it has affected my life in a number of ways, and to have the source of so many anxieties and frustration in your life disregarded as a dream or a fiction leaves a person feeling very alone, unable to really explore their trauma, because the subject is so taboo and very few people are willing to take your account seriously and help you search for answers. This is my story. And I assure you, I have nothing to gain by bringing you a false account. I just want to put my testimony out there so that other experiencers can know that they are not alone and that they are, probably at least, not crazy. There are things in this life that do not yet have a scientific explanation, and humanity is not the only sentient intelligence that operates in this world. Beyond that, I really don't know a damn thing. But accepting the fact is the first step in beginning to fully understand the nature of this world, or any others that may exist. The first time I saw it, I was about eight, maybe as old as ten. I was living in a dingy little house in Clear Lake, Iowa, in what you would consider to be the trashier part of a small tourist town. My room was at the end of a long hallway on the right side of the hall if you were looking toward it from the kitchen on the opposite end. Across the hall, the left side, was my toddler sister's room and in the middle of the hall on the left was the door to my parents' room. One morning I got out of bed and started to move toward the kitchen. When I was just about at my parents' door looking toward the kitchen, the figure appeared. It sort of leaned into the hall from the living room, which was adjacent to the kitchen. It was a tall, black figure. Black as in pitch black, but sort of smoky and hazy, like it was just a bunch of compressed black smoke molded into a human form. 
Everyone seemed tall to me as a kid, but this thing certainly seemed taller than my parents, who were about 5'5 five five and 5'6 five respectively. The only distinguishable feature on the being were that it had two glowing red eyes, just like circular LEDs, on its face. They didn't really seem to be the size and shape that a human eye really is, but truly round and glowing very brightly. This detail I'm sort of fuzzy on, but that's what I recall. From the moment it leaned into view, the thing was just watching me, and when I saw it, I stopped and watched it back. I wasn't exactly scared, but had the distinct impression that this was all it was there to do. To watch. I knew that this wasn't something that I should be seeing in the real world, and I was uncomfortable, but all in all, the thing was non-threatening and didn't make any advancements on me. It just stood there for a minute or two, and then leaned back out into the living room. I didn't follow it to see if it had disappeared, I just went back to my room until my parents woke up. I never quote-unquote woke up from this experience. My day progressed seamlessly into a normal day. I knew that this was not a dream because I was very familiar with my dreams. I had constant night terrors in this house, but I'll get into that later on. The point being, the kinds of dreams that I had were more distinctly bizarre and surreal than this experience, and I always woke up with an understanding that what I had experienced that night was just a dream. This was not the case that morning. If I was dreaming that morning, then I'm still dreaming, because like I said, I never woke up from it. The second experience was just as brief, but a bit more menacing. I can't say how much time passed between the two events, but this incident was dead in the middle of the day, full daylight with other people in the house going about their daily business. My mother was in the living room, and I had just walked into the kitchen and toward the hall. I was now standing approximately where the figure had been on the first occasion, looking down toward my room and my sister's. Suddenly, the figure appeared. This is where it gets really bizarre, because the thing actually crept out of my room. I mean, this effing thing was literally creeping, like some old school Scooby-Doo villain walking on tiptoes with its arms raised and hands bent toward the floor. If you get what I'm illustrating here, you should probably laugh because it was just as goofy as it sounds. It crept from my room into my sister's room, which is what really freaked me out by this event. The whole thing was over in just a few seconds. Moving in this bizarre manner, it had its head turned toward me the entire time. From the moment that it crossed the threshold of my door, its eyes were already on me as if to say, Yeah, I'm here, straight creeping around your house, and there's nothing you can do about it. No one's gonna believe you. I had already told my mom about the first sighting, and of course she had dismissed it as a dream or my overactive imagination. So I didn't bring it up, but I was really scared that it had some sinister intentions with my sister. I do remember her having some nightmares around this time, which I heard from my room, her crying to my mom about how the quote-unquote creature from the Black Lagoon was standing in the corner of her room. I asked her about this years later, but she doesn't remember any details on that. So that's it. That's all I saw of this shadow person. But there's another element to my life at this house that I feel might be relevant to what I experienced. As I mentioned earlier, I was prone to night terrors while living in this house. Vivid but bizarre nightmares that almost always had something to do with being chased by various demons, monsters, etc. One recurring type of dream I had went like this. I'd be laying in my bed, everything seeming to be completely normal in my room, as it was in waking life, but I would get this feeling. It was this instinctual understanding that something horrible was about to come through my door. I would start to panic, but would be unable to move my body, so rather than use my arms and legs to physically leave my bed, I would, through a sheer force of will, hover off of my bed and float to the corner of the ceiling, as out of reach as possible. Nothing else was really different about my room and these experiences except for that dread. 
the dread that something was trying to get in. Another night I had a similar dream, where I woke up in my familiar room to find a tall, hairy man standing above me, reaching for me. I had the strong sense that this skinny, ape-like man was there to take me, and I recall doing my best to resist him, but the ending to that dream is fuzzy. That scares me to this day, more than the shadow person encounters, because the hairy men are a pretty common occurrence in high strangeness research, so I can't help but worry that there was some reality to that experience. I bring these dreams up because it seems that vivid nightmares in certain locations, this happened only in that house, that also have reported paranormal activity indicates a relationship between the two. If you subscribe to the idea that these beings feed off of fear, then it seems plausible that the two are connected. There was one time I was staying at a hotel in Madrid, not too far from the airport, and by the time my buddy and I arrived there, it was 11pm. I had completely messed up the booking information because I forgot that we were losing a day by traveling from California. Since my buddy and I had arrived to the hotel so late, we were exhausted. Still, we were given our room number, a card, and sent up to our room. I noticed that the more turns we made down a hallway, the less lights worked. By the time we reached our room door, it was dark and scary. I didn't want to say anything, implying that I was feeling uneasy about the room because I was 24 at the time, so I had to be tough, and my buddy was 27. Once we opened the door, the room was bright and looked very modern. I felt a whole lot better upon entry. The room was supposed to have two full-size beds, but for some reason they were pushed together to make a giant bed. My buddy and I agreed it wasn't a big deal, just to stay on our sides of it and deal with it until tomorrow when we weren't so tired. I slept on the left, and he slept on the right. Sometime between 1 and 4 a.m. when it was very dark in the room, I woke up and saw a man standing in the corner. I knew for sure that the man wasn't my friend. My buddy Cody is 6 foot 2, 195 pounds. The guy standing in the corner looked about 5'10", 180. This was the first and only time I ever experienced sleep paralysis. I remember staring at the guy, who appeared to have his back to me facing the corner of the room closest to me, as if he was counting for a game of hide and seek. I stared at my arm hanging off the bed to the left, and focused all of my energy and strength to move it, but I could not. I tried to scream for Cody to wake up so that at least he would know of the man in our room, but no sound would come out of my mouth. I've never panicked so hard in my life, and before I knew it, my eyes closed, and I was unconscious again. It wasn't until 7.30am that I woke up and screamed Cody's name, and hit him. It was as if everything I tried to do during the night suddenly came out all at once. He woke up startled, of course, as I came to the realization that everything was okay. The order of everything I'm about to say next is how I knew that there was a ghost in that room. I told Cody, dude, I just freaked out. It's just that last night, and before I was able to finish my sentence, Cody said, Did you see that guy in the corner? My jaw dropped as he told me he experienced the exact same thing as I had the night before. He had sleep paralysis and couldn't move as he stared at that man. We had all of our belongings still and nothing was changed about the room. It still scares me when I think about it until this day. How we could never explain what happened that night or how we both experienced the same thing. Cody ended up experiencing another ghost in a hostel that we stayed at at one time. But as for me, that was the only ghost experience I ever had while traveling. A few years ago, a friend and I took a road trip across country. We stopped at an out-of-the-way place in Wyoming late at night. 
As soon as we rolled up, we both felt as if it were haunted, but really needed to sleep, so we checked in and put anything paranormal out of our minds. The place was very run down. We had two beds in our room. Mine was closest to the door and window with a nightstand in between us. Also, we each had a little lamp above our beds. I laid down, clicked off my lamp, and was facing the window. While lying down, I saw a black, shadowy figure cross the length of the wall and then vanish. About 30 seconds later, after I had laid my head down, my friend began playing with my hair. I sat upright and said, what the... But she was in her bed, five feet away, reading her book. I didn't say anything because, as mentioned, we just wanted to sleep. Later that night, my friend woke me and asked if she could sleep in my bed with me. I said yes, but didn't ask why. That morning, we had confession time. I told her that I thought that she was playing with my hair, that's why I sat up in bed before falling asleep. She said that she had looked over and saw a black, shadowy figure hovering above me at the moment when I had looked up. During the night, after she had turned her light off, someone was playing with her feet, rubbing them, massaging them, etc. She couldn't get any sleep and was freaked out, which is why she cowered over to my bed. That morning, we asked the waitress in the very creepy stuffed animal heads on the wall dark musty coffee shop if the place was haunted. She said she wasn't allowed to comment on that. We pressured her to tell us the history of the place. She told us that the hotel used to be POW bunkers, where the Chinese had been held or something like that around World War II. Anyway, I've wanted to go back for a while, and I'm wondering, have any of you had similar experiences? The hotel was in Wyoming, well off the beaten path. It all started when I was five or six years old and had an imaginary friend called Bombo. He was a small Victorian boy who lived with his mother, who I said lived under the floorboards, in the house that I grew up in. I used to talk and play with him all the time, teaching him about things like my Velcro shoes and some of the toys that I had. It was no secret to my family who Bombo was, and even what he looked like, or at least from how I had described him. One day, my sister, who was 14 years old at the time, went back upstairs to our shared room after a family day out and saw him standing in the corner of the room staring at her. He was exactly how I had described him, even down to the detail of his clothes. A few years passed, and I was now 10 or 11 years old. Our family had moved house a couple of times and now lived in a three-story house in a village just outside my hometown. I always had a weird feeling about that house from the moment we moved in, but didn't think much of it over the excitement of having my own room on the top floor that had a skylight. After a few months, things started to get strange. My things would disappear, I would hear footsteps on the middle floor landing at night, etc. These experiences progressively ended up getting stranger, with sounds like nails being dragged up the railings on the top floor getting worse and worse, as well as some nights, my little sister, who was three at the time, screaming, saying that there was a man growling at her in her room. Although, my family put that down to an overactive imagination and didn't really think anything else of it. It was quiet for a couple of months, before everything came back again. This time, it was much worse. This was the first time I saw it. One night I was in my room watching TV and getting things ready for school the next day. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a face peering in at me through my skylight. Its skin was dark, and its eyes were white with no pupils, only veins, dark circles around its eyes leading to black cracks across its face. It was grinning at me, and even without pupils, I knew that it had its eyes locked on me. Needless to say that after a few seconds of initial shock, I ran downstairs to the rest of my family and refused to go back into my room. Shortly after this, my older sister, who had given birth recently and was living with us temporarily, had her own experience. 
As she was sleeping one night, she heard a knock on her door between 2 and 3 a.m. Thinking I was the one knocking, she shouted, what? Twice, with no response. The door flung open after a few seconds with such force that the dresser had dented the door from the impact. No one was there. Shortly afterwards, we moved again for personal reasons to the house that we have now been in for years. For years, there was no unusual experiences other than the occasional sound of footsteps. Nothing that could be logically explained. When I was 18, my sleep schedule was the same as any teenager, waking up around noon and going to bed around 3 to 4 a.m. This one night in particular, I was up doing the same as always, listening to music, watching films, etc. At midnight, I went downstairs to the kitchen as usual to get some snacks. On my way back out of the kitchen, I saw it again. It was standing behind the front door looking in through one of the glass panels. It was the same face that I saw all those years ago. Same skin. Same eyes. Same dark circles and cracking features. It was staring right at me, this time with one of its hands leaning on the other glass panel as it watched me. The only difference was that this time it wasn't grinning. After standing there for what felt like an eternity, I ran as fast as I could up to my room and locked myself inside. I didn't sleep a wink that night. Some family friends who were regular churchgoers theorized after they heard what I saw that this thing that I saw was Bombo, or what had taken the form of him in the first place, and that when I had stopped giving him my attention and energy, he had then tried to use another way of getting my attention. I don't know what to think for sure. All I know is that what I saw was the exact same thing that I saw as a child, and it came back. It's been four years since the last time I saw it, and I hope I never see it again. When I was a kid, I lived in a one-story house that had a very small space that you could consider an attic. We didn't keep anything up there because it was such a small space. I don't even know where the entrance to it was, if there was one. But, and this started right as we moved in, after we would go to bed, I lived with my grandparents. I would start hearing footsteps up there. I knew they were footsteps because they would move in a rhythm and go from one end of the house to the other. I lived in that house from when I was 8 to 12 years old, and this happened every night. I repeatedly tried telling my grandparents about this and they always said it was just the house settling. I was never able to sleep well as a kid, so while my grandparents would be asleep as soon as 8pm struck, I would be lying awake in bed staring at the ceiling. It was always the most terrifying when the footsteps stopped right above me, like right over my bed, and then in a few seconds to minutes they would walk back to some other location up there. Nobody ever believed me that this was happening. My granddad had even found holes that had apparently been drilled in several of the walls, one in the bathroom, and he wrote it off as a previous owner running cables through the walls lived in that house for four years, and was convinced that someone was living in the ceiling above us and would become active when they thought that we had gone to sleep. I'll never forget that. It always happened at the same time of night, right after we went to bed. This was back in the late 90s to the early 2000s, so I don't know if there could have been cameras or something that they could have been watching us on, but they definitely knew when we went to bed. I'm still to this day convinced that someone was up there. Paranormal? I don't know. It's worth mentioning that one of the previous owner's kids did die in the house. They had a wolf-dog hybrid as a pet that mauled him in the living room. Anyway, I thought I'd share that because literally no one believed me, ever, to this day. But I know that footsteps are different from houses settling. 
This would go on into the wee hours of the morning, and I would usually finally pass out when the footsteps had gone off to a different part of the house. Ever since I was a kid, I had paranormal experiences. One intense rule of the house my mom gave me was never to participate in a Ouija board. When I was 14 years old, I'm now 20, I let my curiosity get the best of me and decided to do a Ouija board with a friend. In my room in the complete dark, we began the process. To my surprise, nothing happened. Later that night, I let my mind and fear get the best of me and decided to sleep with my mom, who had no clue that I had previously participated in a Ouija board, otherwise she would have killed me. As I was falling asleep, my mom asleep right next to me, I saw the silhouette of a large man in the doorway. At first, I told myself that it was just my brother. I called his name twice, then noticed that this figure was at least six inches taller than my brother and completely unresponsive to what I was saying. I started to panic and pray as I realized that this was not my brother and perhaps something far more evil that I had invited into the house. I was too afraid to move or to wake my mom. After about five minutes, though it felt like ten years, the figure disappeared. I struggled to sleep for the rest of the night. The next morning, I was getting ready with my mom in the bathroom. Keep in mind that she has no idea what I had seen in her room last night, or even that I had done the Ouija board. She brings up to me a nightmare that she had had the previous night. After I asked her to tell me, the answer brought me to tears. She said that there was a demonic entity in the hallway, and as she went to touch it, it threw her across the room. As I broke down in tears and told her the truth, we proceeded to bless our house. I will never do a Ouija board again. I'm an OTR truck driver, which means that I drive across the country multiple times in a month-long period. I'd like to share a story with you. On the dark July night around 2 a.m., I was headed south on US 93 Highway in Nevada. I was approximately 30 miles north off of Las Vegas. Traffic was scarce. I had not seen a single vehicle for at least 40 minutes. The only source of light that illuminated the road were the truck headlights. I was on the phone with a friend of mine just chatting about random stuff when in the distance about 300 feet ahead of me I saw something on the shoulder of the road. At first I thought it might have been a turned over construction sign or a bag of some sort. But as I was approaching the object, I started to make out some features. It was a human-like figure, I thought. Just to be clear, that area is deserted and there's absolutely nothing to be found within a 25 mile radius. When I was about five yards away, I could see it clearly. It was a boy. He was around eight to ten years old, I'd say. He had a school backpack and a white plush bunny in his right arm held tightly against his chest. He was just standing there with his cold stare, completely unemotional, looking me directly in the eyes. He didn't break the stare as I passed him. He didn't even blink or flinch, and let me remind you that it's an 80,000 pound semi-truck moving at 65 miles an hour. My heart was racing. My whole body was covered in goosebumps. A cold chill went down my spine. I don't think that I have ever been so disturbed in my life since I've never had any paranormal encounters. Once I passed him, the first thing that came to my mind was that if I see him appear again a couple of miles ahead, I'm gonna have a heart attack. But thankfully, it never happened. The rest of the trip was uneventful. I still don't know what it was. I'm not trying to claim that it was a ghost or the spirit of a deceased child. I just can't find any adequate explanation to it. It was definitely not a hallucination since I was wide awake and talking on the phone. It just seems weird to me. 
What in the world was a 10-year-old kid doing by himself in the middle of a desert? My mom and I both work at a very old, very haunted hotel. We used to be incredibly open about our haunting experiences, but our current owner is a real jerk who refuses to acknowledge any of it, despite the business that it could bring in. So we no longer put it in the brochures or broadcast it in any way. But I guess it makes it all the more convincing when the guests tell us crazy stories, as they usually have no prior knowledge of the hauntings or even the history of this place. Which is a real shame, because the building has had some serious connections to incredible people who played a major part in founding the country. So a few weeks back, we were in the middle of our January lull. Every year during that month, a lot of us get laid off because we're not needed, so it's pretty quiet around here between the lack of both guests and employees. However, this night we did have two guests check in, both of whom were local, and they were celebrating a special occasion as the guy had flowers delivered to the room before they checked in. They went to the restaurant to eat dinner, and then went to their room shortly after 9pm. At 10.45pm, my mom was startled to see them standing at the front desk with their luggage, looking pale and terrified. They were very reluctant to tell my mom what had happened, but said that they wanted to check out now and not wait until morning. My mom has seen this look on guests' faces before and finally coaxed the truth out of the guy. Apparently, they had went to bed a bit after 10 o'clock and half an hour later they shot awake to a great crash and the sound of glass breaking. They scrambled out of bed and flipped the light switch on and could not believe what they saw. The massive, heavy glass lamp on the bedside table had been knocked off onto the floor where it lay in pieces next to the alarm clock as though someone had just taken their arm and swept the whole lot off in a rage. After seeing this, the couple grabbed their things and bolted from the room. When they were checking out, they were so embarrassed that they didn't even want a refund and refused my mom's offer to move them to another room, even though it would have been a huge upgrade. The woman just kept saying, I just want to sleep in my own bed tonight. And the guy told my mom, we may come back one day, but never again during the month of January when the hotel is nearly empty. My mom apologized as best she could for the craziness and checked them out, and she gave them a refund anyway since they had only used the room for a very short while. When they left, she and a co-worker immediately went to view the room and found everything just as they described. While they were marveling at the strangeness of it all, a faint sound nearly scared them to death. It was the woman's cell phone vibrating under the sheets, where she had left it in their frenzy to escape. They grabbed the phone and headed back to the front desk, where they were met by the guy asking to come if they had found it. With his wife in the car waiting, he decided to open up a bit more to my mom about the incident as his wife was already terrified and he knew it would only make it worse for her. He said that before they fell asleep, he had an undeniable sense of dread, as if something were going to happen. And when the sound first woke him up, he looked toward the foot of the bed and saw the silhouette of his wife standing there. He asked if she was okay and heard her voice answer right next to him. She was still in the bed. We've had people hear voices and music, see apparitions, and capture incredible images on camera, one of which was a young man dressed in colonial era clothing, and you can see him clearly down to his hair and belt. But for someone or something to sweep a lamp and clock off of a table so hard that it breaks the lamp is very unusual. Our phenomena is very rarely of the physical variety, so I am not sure what to make of this. I myself have never been frightened of whatever is here, maybe because I'm a history lover and would almost welcome the prospect of seeing someone from such a long gone era. As to who the woman was that this guy saw at the foot of his bed, I have no clue. We have a very well-known female spirit in the hotel, supposedly from the era when it was a Civil War hospital, but the building also served as an elite college for women and of course was a home when it was first built. It could have been anyone for all we know.
I used to work as a cleaner when I was 16 and between colleges. This is the UK, so I had already left school. The place where I worked was a popular clothing store near my house and was built over ancient farmland. There were also rumors of druid burial grounds nearby, but that's another story. I've always been sensitive to the paranormal from a very young age, but this was by far the most haunted place I've ever worked and my first apparition sighting. We were a team of four to five people, and all of us were assigned to different parts of the store. One of the sections was the women's fitting rooms. We would vacuum the rugs and cubicles, polish the mirrors, and all of that. You would hear high heels on the tiles the whole time that you were down there, and the sounds of rustling paper, coat hangers rattling, that kind of thing. There was also a general feeling of discomfort and unease, as though you were being followed and watched. This is hours before the store opened, so of course there were no customers. Sometimes a manager would be there, but they stayed upstairs in the office. The next part was the men's clothing area, which was on the second floor. When you cleaned there, you were alone but for the occasional manager walking through. One time I was on the floor cleaning the railings by the cash registers, and a huge black shadow swept over me. I was surprised because I hadn't heard anybody approach, and as I looked around, I was definitely alone. My cleaning routine was to sweep the floor and collect the dirt into little piles around the pillars, then sweep it up all in one go at the end. The dirt piles moved constantly. I would go back to do the final big sweep and some of the piles always would have disappeared. After I clocked out, the piles would be there again. I had a sense that the spirit was a young male farmhand who was very mischievous. I said as much to my coworker, and she told me that she refuses to clean in that area after polishing the mirrors one day and seeing the disembodied head of a young man peering over her shoulder. Aside from my instances with the piles, I would always hear the sound of coat hangers rattling and shuffling noises, but I never felt threatened by it. I used to laugh it off or just tell the spirit to stop, and he would most of the time. Now, after the store was clean, we would clean the staff quarters. Toilets and canteen, meeting rooms. The toilets were a non-paranormal horror in themselves. Note, I worked here with my mother. We were assigned to clean the female toilets, and usually if someone was using them, we would leave and give them privacy until they finished. So we went in, the middle stall was closed, and we heard rustling paper and heavy breathing. So we left and waited. And waited. And waited. The cleaning cupboard was right next to the toilets, and didn't even have a door. We would have seen and heard anybody who might have left. To leave and enter the toilets, you would have to walk straight past the open doorway and then walk down the corridor that directly faced it. It was an L-shaped corridor, with the toilets on the far end and the cleaning cupboard on the corner. Except when we went in after waiting 10 to 15 minutes, the middle stall door was wide open and empty. Now, on to the apparition. The children's clothing area was generally less creepy. There were coat hangers moving again. Sometimes things would fall off the shelves and rails, but we always just shrugged it off. The elevator was directly opposite the children's clothing, and we usually loaded our cleaning equipment into the elevator because it was too heavy to carry up the stairs. I remember rinsing my mop out, and I glanced up. There was a little boy around six or seven years old standing directly in front of me. He wore a flat cap, a pale shirt with suspenders, dark shorts, and socks up to his knees. At first I thought it was a mannequin, and when I blinked, he was gone. I thought I was just tired, and I shook my head. I spoke to my mother about it later, as she's Wiccan and super into the supernatural, and I described the boy to her. She had seen the exact same child a few weeks before, but only the back of him, as if he had been walking around a corner. She told me that she had the feeling he had died of lung-related issues, perhaps tuberculosis or pneumonia. So there you have it. Some of it can be explained by tiredness, I know, but I just thought I would share this experience.
So I don't know how many people really believe in ghosts, or the paranormal, or in people who say that they can see them. I would never say that I'm some professional psychic or medium. I'm not. I just know that I've always been able to see things that other people couldn't, hear things other people couldn't, and knew things that other people didn't. Pretty much my whole life. I felt like a freak and a weirdo for a long time until I just realized this is happening and it isn't going away, so I needed to accept it. I got help from professional mediums and the woo-woo community and it helped. Backstory, but important. I was laying in bed in my room a couple years ago, trying to fall asleep. It was a long hallway and my sister's room was at the end and so was my mom's. My sister had a friend over who was dealing with an abusive boyfriend, and they were drinking and talking about it. This will also be important. You know how you get that feeling that someone's watching you? Or that feeling in a store when you just know that someone has stepped into your space? You don't have to look. You just know. That's what I felt. I looked up, and there's some girl with just her head poked into my room sideways. I just saw her head sideways leaning past my door frame. She looked shorter, maybe twenties, with long black hair, kind of like the girl from The Ring. I'm looking at her wondering what she wanted, and she started to smile. Slowly her eyes got huge and black, and her jaw unhinged into this giant, sick, pitch black grin. Ice cold slammed into the pit of my stomach as I just stared at her for what felt like hours frozen in fear before what I'd been taught kicked in and I made her leave. She instantly turned back to normal and skipped off down my hallway toward my sister's room. I thought, oh, is it my sister's friend? Depression and abuse and all those bad situations can really attract those types of beings, so I didn't think anything of it. Fast forward to literally last night. It's been years. My parents got divorced, which is a whole other post of creepy shit. I realized it wasn't just my dad who was the narcissist. It's absolutely my mom, too. They were a toxic pair. And currently, I'm in a situation where I have to live with my mom. It's fine. It's free. I'll be grateful and deal with it. Last night, I'm laying in my bed watching TV, minding my own business. Suddenly, I feel that feeling again. It's always the same feeling, regardless of what type of ghosty it is. For me, anyways. I look at my door, and it's the exact same girl. I asked her what she was doing here, and she didn't respond. She just started smiling. Only this time, her eyes went white, and her mouth grew into the same huge black grin, but she had tons of teeth like a shark. I get up to get my incense, which drives them out, and she runs in the direction of my mom's room. I go out into the hallway to look in that direction, and I see through my mom's cracked door this weird demon girl literally sitting crouched on top of my mom, staring at me. Almost like she was an animal claiming her prey. It was wild. I've never ever seen anything like that before. I also realized that this girl was never with my sister's friend. She was with my mom for however many years. But my mom's a crazy and very, very negative person regardless of what anyone does to help her. She loves drama, and loves being a victim, and loves complaining, so it's matching her energy, I guess. This ghost girl feels more like a bully than anything truly demonic. Like she had fun picking on people, which my mom absolutely does too. This ghost girl can't hurt me. She's just around, and man, it sure is scary when she is. She looks like an absolute demon, that's for sure. I've since seen other types of entities in her room at night while she slept, and have told her about it. She says I'm crazy at first, and then in the days that follow, she'll tell me how it feels dark.
Back in October, I decided to treat my girlfriend to a night away at a popular British seaside town. The town is one of those historical areas, which has its fair share of ghost legends and gothic tourism, so there was lots of touristy attractions such as ghost walks, which me and my girlfriend decided to go on. A bit of background information about the hotel. It is regarded as one of the oldest hotels in the town and is also a popular tavern among the locals. The inn itself had a rather creepy feel to it, but our room was modern and comfortable. The last place you'd imagine paranormal activity to occur. We set off on the ghost walk with a local guide who knew about the paranormal hotspots. Unexpectedly at the time, we stopped directly outside our hotel. This is the most haunted hotel in town. Good luck if you're staying here, he cackled. He proceeded to tell us that there was a number of spirits that haunted the building, and guests frequently experienced sightings and unexpected things. However, at the time, we were a bit drunk from dinner, and we brushed off the walk as your typical tourist trap. We went to bed without any issues at all. I woke up later that night, paralyzed, and with a sense of unease. I felt what I would describe as a strong, cold gale blowing around the room. Imagine being outside in strong, windy weather. The sensation lasted for, I would say, about 15 seconds when it suddenly stopped and the room filled with a warm, relaxed sensation once again. I woke my girlfriend to tell her, and she brushed it off, saying it was probably sleep paralysis and a draft. So I believed her and went back to sleep. I thought nothing of it until we checked out. The receptionist asked us how our stay was and if there had been any issues. Everything was perfect, but there was a really big draft in the room, I exclaimed, as you would. Surprisingly, she casually laughed. No, that's not a draft. It's just a spiritual presence in the room. It happens all the time in that one, she casually reassured us. Now I'm really interested in the paranormal, so I asked about the stuff in the hotel. She told us that everything the guy told us on the walk was indeed true, and the spirits are those of old landlords and locals whom help run the hotel and keep the guests safe. She told me lots of stories of how guests would stumble on the stairs and be caught by an unseen presence, as well as children's lost toys showing up right at the moment where they're about to start crying. She even told us that one of the past landlady spirits acts as a bouncer, causing troublemaking and aggressive guests to feel ill enough to leave. The receptionist seemed really happy and was used to the paranormal activity in the hotel and says that she regularly sleeps alone in the rooms without any worry. Obviously, this isn't that much of a scary ghost story, but more of an interesting experience. I would definitely go back for another stay in that hotel. In June of 2016, my mother died of cancer. Five of my six siblings and I were fortunate enough to make the trip to the small town of Harper, Texas to be with her in her final days. If you've ever been to Harper or have driven through, you know that there's not much to it. With a population just shy of 1,100 people, one restaurant, and one stoplight, it could be more accurately described as a rest stop along US Highway 290. To keep my sanity during the trip, rather than stay in my mother's tiny and now very overcrowded house, I opted to stay at a hotel in nearby Fredericksburg, about 25 miles away. For the next two weeks, I made the drive daily to spend time with my family, making the most of that time that we had left with our mother. One by one, my siblings and I eventually had to return to our normal lives, although one brother and sister would stay with our mother until she passed. It was the hardest thing I have ever done, leaving my mother and knowing full well that I would not get to see her again in this plane of existence. I had a very early morning check-in time for my car rental and flight back to California. Since I would need to get up at 3 a.m. to drive the 85 miles to San Antonio, I felt it prudent to get back to my hotel in Fredericksburg and try to get some sleep before departure. Sleep did not come easily. Although I was tired and emotionally drained, it was still very early in the evening. After what seemed like an eternity of tossing and turning, I finally managed to doze off and slept for a few hours until it happened. 
I awoke suddenly and opened my eyes wide, but did not try to move from the position in which I lay. I felt an unmistakable presence with me in the room, like someone had been standing in front of my bed and watching me. I slowly peeled back the comforter from my head, and still trying not to move, mustered whatever courage I had at that moment, and looked. At the foot of the bed, I saw a dark silhouette appearing to just stand there. Considering my emotional state at that moment, I quite literally said out loud, Oh hell no, and just pulled the comforter back over my head, knowing the next time I looked, whatever it was I thought I saw standing there would be gone. What happened next was one of those moments that stay with you for a lifetime. As I lay there with my head covered, I held my breath momentarily and just listened. Seconds later, I felt someone sitting down on the foot of the bed. I could feel the bed shift slightly, and the weight of the comforter on my legs got significantly heavier. I remember being upright at that moment, throwing the covers off of me and saying, uh, nope, no way. I got out of bed and now paced the floor, trying to both calm and reassure myself that I was in fact the only one in the room. I looked at the clock and saw that it was just after midnight and then made the obvious choice that I would stay awake for the next few hours before checking out of the hotel and driving to the airport. I opened the mini fridge and found an energy drink, then turned on the TV and texted my wife about what I had just experienced. At 3 a.m., I was at the hotel front desk to check out and settle my bill. The night auditor was a very nice young lady who had greeted me with a smile, commented on my very early departure, and asked if I had gotten enough sleep. I shook my head and proceeded to tell her what had happened to me in my room earlier that night, still a little freaked out. Her expression now more serious, the auditor leaned forward and said in a lowered tone that she knew that the hotel was haunted. In the dead of night, she would hear children running up and down the hall, look, but see no one there. Chairs would slide across the floor in the nearby dining room, making an unmistakable sound she said she heard quite often. I paid my bill, thanked her for sharing her experiences in the haunted hotel, and was soon on the highway driving to the airport, homeward bound. I have experienced many paranormal occurrences at my own home, but never while traveling. My family and I moved into a new house. It used to have an attic, but it's been sealed off. After a couple of months into living in this house, sometimes I'm just watching TV and I hear scratching from the roof. I just play it off as a bird, as they're common where I live. After three weeks, the scratching has gotten worse and more frequent. It's like it's trying to scratch its way out of the roof. By the way, the attic entrance thing is above the outside of my sister's room. One day, my sister tells my dad that the seal is open. My dad gets confused because it was supposed to be sealed off completely. My dad goes to close it and realizes that it's really hard to open and close, so whatever opened it was strong. That's when I start to get skeptical. The same night I go to get some snacks from the fridge, I open it to find out that they are all gone. I thought my siblings must have eaten them. In the morning, my parents are going on about a missing cake. The cake was supposed to be for my niece's birthday. They ask if I had anything to do with it, and I said no, along with all my other siblings. I was getting really suspicious about the attic, so I built up the courage to go and check it out. Note that I am probably the most paranoid person in the world, so I was scared for my life, but my curiosity got the best of me. I get the ladder, a torch, and a knife, just in case. I open the entrance. I shine my torch to see nothing. But as I search more, I see the cake, empty snack packets, dirty clothes, and a short, dark silhouette. It just freezes in place. Immediately, I bolt and scream for my parents and tell them everything. They tell me to stay in my room. They go up and check, but there was no one there. I'm still shaken from that moment and get nightmares from it. We have since moved from that home and now live a normal, non-scary life.
I was 14 at the time this happened. I had just moved downstairs because I wanted more privacy, as my parents were always checking in on me. I've always been a rebellious kid and wanted to be alone and do my own thing, without anyone telling me not to. I had always noticed strange things happening around my house, and I kept asking my parents if they were going through my stuff in my room. They would always say no, so I always brushed it off. These things still happen to me to this day, like things being moved and waking up in a cold sweat, with no explanation. One night I was on my phone and I felt this feeling of dread and anxiety come over me. I then heard a voice say, it's okay, and I looked up and a black silhouette of a woman was standing at the foot of my bed. She had no face, but I could clearly see the outline of a petite woman just standing there. I remember feeling very scared, but also very calm at the same time. I was looking at her for 15 seconds before she vanished. I told my parents what had happened, and they were also scared because my dad would always say that he felt a presence in the house. I instantly moved back up to the main floor. I remember telling people about it, and I would always remind them that my parents built the house, so there were no previous owners. People have given the idea that it was my grandma who passed away a year before this happened. I still question if this is true. I've not had anything that intense happen to me again. I still have the nightmares, and also question what she meant. Why was it okay? I remember telling that to myself over and over. I'm thinking of moving back down soon, but for now, I think I'm good. I traveled quite a bit when I was younger, specifically in the Pacific Northwest of the US, as that's where I'm from. Whenever my single mother, older sister, and I took a break at the various rest stops along the way, I was almost always met by an older woman, likely in her 50s, early 60s. She offered my sister and I a variety of treats, generally hot cocoa and cookies or lemonade depending on the weather. We always took it graciously. I think my mom assumed that we always bought the things with our allowance at the little shop that sometimes integrated into the rest stop buildings, but I always remember that woman being at a white plastic table with black legs and never charging us any money. She never spoke. She was the highlight of many trips. I always felt safe and attribute her presence with my love for road trips and rest stops in general. Well, I brought her up a few years back in conversation with my mom and sister, and while my sister seemed to remember her, my mom did not, and pointed out how ridiculous that would be. I honestly hadn't thought much of it since I was eight or nine, and just took her to be part of the travel experience, but our trips spanned everywhere between Idaho and California, and I know that I saw her at least once every trip from ages five to eight. As the chances of us coincidentally meeting so often without my mom noticing are very slim, I can only assume that there was something going on. I know that this could be a muddled memory and have generally ruled it out as one, but I have had many ghost experiences as a child that I hesitate to abandon entirely. Does anyone else have any similar experiences that might be related? If this kind woman is still helping wandering children keep their bellies warm, I would love to leave her a thank you on my next voyage. This happened around the end of November of last year, while I was at a late night party at a mutual friend's house. The night started off fine with us having a few drinks and talking about the classes that we would be taking next semester. This pretty much went on till around 2 a.m. and by this time I wanted to go home since the party was already dying down and most of my friends had already left and I was practically there alone. Instead of wasting money on an Uber, I decided to walk home since my neighborhood was only a few blocks away, but it was still a decent walk. However, there was a shortcut. 
There was a secluded dirt road in the neighborhood which led to a stretch of walkway with an irrigation canal for crops, and it happened to lead straight to the backyard of my house. I began making my way to the lonely dirt road, and I started to second-guess my decisions since that stretch of walkway can be pretty shady, especially at night since a few drug dealers and junkies like to hang out there. I mustered up the little courage I had, feeling confident that I'd be able to handle myself if anything ever hit the fan, so I proceeded to walk on the desolate road. The night sky was well lit. The moon illuminated my surroundings enough for me to see my environment pretty clearly. The walk was actually pleasant. The only thing that made it tough to navigate was the overgrown thorny weeds and mesquite branches that kept scraping against the exposed parts of my skin. As I continued to walk through the brush, I finally got to the clearing that led to the bridge, and to my relief, there didn't seem to be anyone in sight. As I began to cross the bridge, I then picked up a faint scent of lavender mixed with something rancid, like the smell of a good cheese or days-old roadkill. I couldn't even tell where it was coming from, but as soon as I made it to the other side of the bridge, the environment seemed to suddenly shift. It's hard to describe, but there was this heavy pressure that washed over me, like being submerged underwater coupled with this gut feeling telling me that something about the environment was just off. I pushed the feeling off as a random anxiety attack, since I do get them sometimes, but deep down I knew this was different. To calm my nerves, I stopped walking and did slow breathing and began to count to ten while clenching and releasing my fist to try and shake off this bad vibe or whatever it was. When I finished my little ritual, I felt a little better and more at ease. I started to walk in the direction of my house until I heard this odd grunting sound come from behind me. I turned around, and I saw a woman with short black hair and a silky white gown crouched down with her back turned away from me. She was just a few feet away, and it was strange because when I crossed the bridge I didn't see anyone around the area. Did I pass by her without even realizing it? I thought to myself. She was hunched over after all, and I do tend to get caught up in my own little world. At this point, the faint smell from earlier was just overbearing, so much so that it started seeping into my sense of taste. I covered my mouth with the bottom of my t-shirt, trying to shield myself from it, while I yelled out the muffled words, Hello ma'am, do you need any help? She paid no mind to me as she continued to make that weird grunting sound, and I was creeped out at this point, so I walked away a couple steps and turned to get a better look at her. She then decided to stand up, still with her back turned to me, and muttered the word muerte, which means death in Spanish. Confused, trying to understand what the strange woman had said to me, she then slowly turned to meet my gaze, and all the blood in my body pooled in my gut when I saw her face. It was extremely long, too long for a normal human body to be supporting it. The head of this thing almost resembled that of a horse or a donkey's head in the eyes. I'll never forget the eyes, as much as I've tried to. They were gaping pits of blackness surrounded by a sea of red. Complete silence fell over the area as I was petrified by what I was witnessing. My brain, a scrambling mess, was trying to make sense of the unnatural abomination that was before me. The creature then decided to let out what I can only describe as a high-pitched scream like a cross between a pig squealing and a woman's wailing. My fight-or-flight reflex then kicked in and I started sprinting to my house. I didn't even bother trying to unlock the gate to my fence. I jumped over it with ease. My grandmother saw when I came barging into the house. The words wouldn't even leave my mouth to tell her what I had seen, as the fatigue quickly kicked in after the adrenaline wore off. But afterwards, I described everything to her. With a look of urgency, she then decided to perform a cleansing ritual. The ritual involved rubbing an egg all across my body in three circular motions while chanting a special prayer. She then cracked the egg that she was using into a clear glass cup that was half filled with water 
And when she did, the egg came out with streams of blood, and the yolk that came out of the egg looked similar to a human pupil, which is a very bad omen for the person who is being cleansed. After seeing this, she laid her hands on my forehead and chanted another prayer for about a minute, and threw the raw yolk out of our house and into the driveway. She didn't bother to say anything to me until the following morning, when she reluctantly told me that what I encountered was an entity that specifically preys on men, kind of like a succubus, and told me that this thing had a very dark and malicious intent, and that I was lucky to have gotten away from it. To this day, I haven't set foot on that stretch of road again. A few years ago, me and a buddy from the army decided to meet and catch up. We decided on the date and place. After several hours at the local pub, it was 3 a.m., we had three beers each and decided to go pay our respects to a friend of ours who had died a few years ago and was with us in the army. We bought a bottle of our friend's favorite booze and drove toward the graveyard. When we got there and started to walk toward the gate, we both saw someone standing there. As we got closer, I could definitely recognize the very friend that we were going to visit. He was standing there in his uniform holding a rifle and was waving at us to come closer. I was incredibly freaked out by what I was seeing. I just turned to my friend and looked at him and asked him if he was seeing the same thing. He was so shocked that he couldn't even talk and was just nodding his head with his mouth open. We backed away slowly and went back to the car and drove away as fast as we could from there. Where I'm from, they say never go close if you see the dead calling you over. But ever since that day, I keep hearing someone call my name behind me when I'm all alone. At first, I thought it was my wife messing with me, but that's not possible, because it's a male voice. Once again, I'm really freaking out. A few times I left my phone recording on all night to prove to my wife that I'm not going insane. But every time I do it, there's zero evidence. Just static and me and my wife snoring in the background. When I, a 24-year-old female, was younger around five, my family moved into an old house on the upstairs floor. An older couple lived below us. This was a long time ago, and I was really little, but I remember this all so vividly. When we were first moving in, my mom had to go up to the attic, which, coincidentally, the door was in what would be my room. She took me and my younger brother up with her because I'm assuming she didn't want to leave us unsupervised. I remember not liking it up there, and then the light turned off. Both my brother and I started screaming about red eyes. I do remember them. It wasn't just one. It was a bunch or a few. I couldn't tell you how many. It turns out that the light turning off was my dad because he didn't think anyone was up there. He turned the light back on and asked what was going on, and me and my brother were still hysterical. The thing is, no one remembers this but me. Not even my brother. I chalk it up to a bad nightmare, except for the fact that I remember every detail. And it turns out a mother had drowned her baby in that attic, and my parents had experiences there as well. I feel like that house was the start of my acknowledgement or awareness of the paranormal. I had to have a Ouija board for Christmas. My wife refused to buy one, so I did it anyway. One night, when my wife was out, my daughter and I tried to use the board. Nothing. The planchette didn't move at all, or if it did, I could feel my daughter pushing it. As I suspected, it's just a parlor game. 
move ahead two weeks. While working in the garage on a guitar amplifier that I was building, I had a very strong feeling that I was being watched. As I had spent many hours previously on this project without any sensations, this was disturbing. It got so bad that I couldn't spend more than a minute or so in the garage after the initial encounter without the hairs on my neck going up. Then came the whispers. More like a shh shh sound, actually. Kind of a be quiet between two or more people lurking about. This only happened when entering the garage from the house. And later, when my daughter called me at work to say she heard shh, shh, when entering the darkened dining room. Since she was alone at the time, I blamed it on the cats. I too experienced it in the house, but usually only when entering the garage itself. Finally, I decided that enough is enough. I went into the garage one night and yelled at whoever was there that they had to leave because they were scaring the crap out of us. No more whispers after that. I wasn't yet into paranormal investigations at the time, so I didn't have a digital audio recorder to leave in the garage overnight. It bothers me now that I had real live spirits in the house to test with and I didn't have the equipment or the moxie to do anything. Before my best friends and I were separated, one passed away, the other moved away. We used to ride around doing all of the haunted legend places within reasonable driving distances. Sometimes we would drive for a few hours, but most of them weren't scary other than the adrenaline filled, hyped up, did you hear or see that? That would cause us to get spooked. This one was different, way different. We were just out of high school, probably 20 at the most, and we were looking for an actually scary place to visit. A lot of people we knew knew that we were into these kinds of things, so we would always get tips on where to go. There was the original three of us that day and another friend that wanted to tag along. After a little drive to our destination, about 45 minutes, we stopped at a Wawa to get gas and grab a few snacks. Like I stated earlier, we were all about 20 at the time, so we were all hyped up because we knew that spooky time was getting close. We'd always pick on that other friend that tagged along. Nothing harsh, but just, ah, you're scared. So I believe it was me that said something along those lines that was overheard by a few people. It got the attention of other people in the Wawa, including these two creepy, older guys who seemed like they didn't fit in. Their clothes were all beat up and dirty and they just didn't seem right for the area and the time was probably 8 p.m. on a Saturday night. What's the little one scared of? Asked one of them. I say little because the three of us are all abnormally tall. The shortest between us was 6'4 and he was normal, so probably about 5'9". We replied and explained how we got tipped to go to this road because it's haunted. They replied that it wasn't scary, and if we wanted a real scare, we should go to this random road. I forget what it was called exactly, but apparently it's this random memorial statue for a plane crash in the middle of the woods, where crazy things are supposed to happen. We grabbed our stuff, didn't think anything of it. As soon as we left, the group started talking and decided to go with the other road that the guys had hiked up. I know. A typical horror movie what not to do. So we get to the entrance of the road, and already it did not disappoint. There were woods on both sides, not one street light in sight. And I remember there was this like detention center off to the right, in the middle of nowhere. So the spooks already began from the moment that we hit the entrance. We decided to drive down the road and search for the statue. We noticed that there were trees cut down on the side of the road and laying parallel to the shoulder of it. We finally find the statue. About five minutes go by in silence, and we decided to enhance the scare factor by shutting the lights off. 
About a minute goes by and we see a shadow figure pop up from the statue. We all freak out as it starts walking toward us, but it was making movements that no human would normally be capable of. It was dark out, but this thing was black. It was darker than the woodsy sky, so we could make out some of it. It was huge. Like I said earlier, we were all extremely large compared to the average guy, but this thing would have dwarfed any of us. We decided to peel out of there and continue down the road figuring that it would lead us out. Boy, were we wrong. About three minutes go by, and we hit a dead end, which in this case was an open spot in the woods with sand everywhere. The cutout was massive, but surrounded by forest. There were different cutouts, and ways to go from there, and I'm pretty sure the road continued after this cutout, but we were pretty deep in the woods by that point. So we decided to turn around and leave, obviously. After we turn around, we stopped to just take in the eerie feeling. The other three guys were talking about the shadow figure that we saw earlier while I happened to catch something out of the corner of my eye. About 40 feet away from me, I see what appears to be a white face, and then another, and another, all surrounding the car. The other guys didn't see them, and I'm rarely ever scared, but seeing me panic, they all knew that something was up. My panic caused them to panic. We then floored it far away from the sand turnaround. We get about half a mile down the road, somewhat near the statue, and pull over to gather our composure before we get out of there. When we stopped, I swear I heard the most typical ghosty ooh kind of noise. This was now turning into a movie I wish that I was never part of. We were really scared. After finding the way that we had come, we started heading back out. Remember those trees I talked about earlier? They were now laying in the middle of the road blocking us in, as we all see the white faces or masks that I had seen earlier. Thank God my one friend, the driver, was good at driving and valued safety over his car. We drove on the edge of the woods and felt like we were defying gravity to speed our way out. The car was literally sideways on the edge of the forest. I mean, I could literally stick a single finger out the window and touch the trees. We all made it home safely that night. After doing research, we found out that that spot was notorious in that area for crazy things happening, such as body dumps and murders. Because of the shadow and the ghost noise that we heard, my head, heart, and gut tells me that that place is actually haunted. As previously stated, that place is famous for dumping bodies, along with the plane crash, so there's bound to be some spirits there. I think where we were that night was actually haunted, but we just happened to be there on a night when there were more things going on. I can't say for certain, but I'm 99% sure that we survived one of their setups that night. I'm 100% sure that I will never go back again. I finally talked my friend into moving from Seattle to Texas. We decided to split the move into two parts, the first one last week, moving her stuff in a rented SUV. We both had some time and we decided to take the trip on all the back roads. We stayed at a mineral springs resort in the middle of nowhere in Oregon that was amazing. On the second day, we got up to drive to Vegas. We took US 50, which is known as the loneliest highway in America. I will admit that before this, it had been 8 to 10 hours before we had had any human contact. I am a former over-the-road trucker and a US veteran, so I'm used to traveling to different places and being in new surroundings every day, but it also taught me to listen to my instincts. Let me tell you, did they come in loud and clear while on this trip a few hours away from Vegas we stopped to get gas? 
As we rolled into the place, I just thought it looked aged, very dated. My friend decided to get gas. I walked inside to look at the place and get some snacks. I can honestly say that I can't point to any one thing that was wrong, but the feeling that overcame me was indescribable. It basically told me that the place was, well, the phrase that I would use is out of place, and that I needed to go right then. Now, I'll admit that this could be my own experience, and maybe because I had such a bad feeling that I was imagining things, but the minute I decided to leave, without buying anything or even using the restroom, I swear everybody in the place started looking at me. And I don't mean just the employees, but the patrons. I walked quickly to my car and told my friend that if she believed in instincts, that we should just get in the car and leave right that second. We did, and we did not breathe easy until we were about 10 miles away. That was my spooky encounter in the middle of Death Valley. This memory still haunts me to this day. I was staying at an old hotel by the beach when I was around eight or nine. It had a reputation for being an extremely haunted location around the western eastern coast of Florida. The hotel I'm referring to is the Plaza, a 100 year old hotel on the coastline. At one point I went down to the lobby to get some utensils for room service. There was a clear door leading to the closed bar area. You were basically looking at the end of the serving counter when you peered in, with chairs on the side and a small beer keg at the end. It was very dark inside the room, and since the door was locked, I could only peek in through the glass. I inspected the room for about ten seconds. Suddenly, I was looking at one of the chairs. It had a giant dent on the right rear leg. Then, suddenly, it flew backward and toppled over. I was so scared that I fell to the ground, and as soon as I landed, I heard what sounded like a woman screaming from the floor above, or possibly the second floor, as this was on the ground floor. It was quite possibly the strangest and most terrifying scream I have ever heard. It lasted about four seconds, and sounded like an old woman mixed with a lion, kind of. Again, this was around the time when I was eight or nine, and seeing as how I am now 23, the memory has become slightly vague. I'm renting a house currently with some of my friends, and since we moved in this summer, there was an attic door that had a lock on it from our landlord. Well, me and my friend got curious and decided to try and pick the lock. We ended up getting the combination, and when we went up there, I took three photos. One is of the front window, one of the back, and one was of an odd postcard on the ground. I sent a photo to a friend, and without me realizing, there was a very clear face in the window with distinct features, eyes, nose, mouth, and head shape. Prior to this, there had been no experiences in the house besides some odd noises. My housemate claims he saw the same face in a different window today, after we locked the attic back up. I'm scared that we may have woken something, and I honestly want nothing to do with it. I grew up in the country in North Carolina. I lived up in the woods where there used to be a water mill. A family lived there back in the 40s. The parents had two daughters and one son. Unfortunately, one of the daughters got caught under the water wheel and drowned. Ever since I was a kid, I always heard humming and low singing in the woods when I was out tromping around. But one thing that really scared me one night is when I was older. I worked for the sheriff's office, and I had left work early one night due to being over on my hours. I got home around 2.30ish, and when I pulled up, I saw the figure of a little girl standing right beside my garage. 
When I got out of my car, she was gone. The next experience I had was when I was out hunting in the same woods. It was super quiet, a beautiful fall evening. I had just gotten down into my stand when all of a sudden I started hearing the same humming and singing I had heard multiple times over the years. But then I heard what sounded like someone walking toward me. I looked around everywhere and couldn't see anything. Then I heard a laugh, but not the same laugh as before. So as I was climbing down my tree stand, a rock hit my boot. And once again, I heard the laughing. Now mind you, the area where I was hunting was about three miles deep in the woods, and there was no one around. I brought my brother and cousin and a few friends down there one night, and we were going to just sit and listen and see if we could hear anything. We were down there playing cards, joking around, when all of us heard what sounded like someone in distress. We all got quiet and listened, and we could hear what sounded like someone breathing heavily. And the thing that confuses me about that night was if it was the little girl or something more dark. Sometimes I think things are better left alone. This is a 100% true story that happened to me when I was about 12. I lived in a really small town in central Wisconsin with my family. My mom had gotten divorced when I was 8, but it was her and her boyfriend and all my siblings in the house, minus the three oldest. I had finally gotten my own room since the three oldest moved out, and was so excited, but for the first couple months I didn't sleep in there because I was too scared so I would sleep with my sister in her room. As we were getting ready to move out of that house, I finally worked up the courage to sleep in my room by myself. My bed was positioned so that when I laid down on my back, I was facing the door. This night in particular, I had kept the bedroom door open because it was a really warm summer night. I remember waking up sometime in the night. I have no idea what time it was, nor do I think I would remember even if I had looked. Anyway, when I woke up, I turned over onto my back and happened to glance outside my door. When I did, I saw this black silhouette of a man who I thought looked just like Abraham Lincoln. Tall, thin, with what looked like a top hat and a beard. He was standing right outside my door next to the railing that led to the stairs. I remember staring for a moment, but getting freaked out and covering my head with the blanket and going back to sleep. Fast forward about a year to where we were moved into our new house, a small mobile home in the middle of nowhere, and I had a dream. In the dream, I was back in the old house, my childhood home. I remember all I could think was, I'm home. It felt so calm, so familiar. Everything was exactly how I remembered it, down to my messy room. In my dream, I went exploring through the house, reminiscing. I was so glad to be back, but then I woke up. It was such a nice dream, but I eventually forgot about it. And that was when I had my second dream. It was roughly a month or so later. I was back in my old home, but something was off. As I was walking through, I realized that things were missing. The china cabinet in the dining room was gone, and so was the stereo we had in the living room, and so on. Just little things. It didn't feel as familiar or as happy as the last dream that I had had, but when I woke up yet again and, just like the last time, I eventually forgot about it. Fast forward again to probably two or three months later and I had another dream. I was back in my childhood home, surprise surprise, and again things were missing and the whole energy just felt off. I remember feeling very uneasy and uncomfortable there, but I couldn't leave. And then I saw it again. The Abraham Lincoln looking shadow that I had seen a year before. He was just wandering the halls upstairs. I got really freaked out and tried to leave, but then I woke up again. And again, I forgot about the dream not too long after. 
Finally, just a few short months later, when I was staying at my grandparents' house, I had what would be the last dream. I was back in my old home again, and this time, everything was gone. The whole house was empty. It probably looked like that because that was how it looked the last time I saw it, right before we officially left. But anyway, I was walking through the house feeling so creeped out, and again like last time, just wanting to leave. It no longer felt like home. Then there was this man, or figure. It didn't look like the shadow that I had seen before, but I couldn't make out any features either. He asked me if I was okay, and I said no, and that I wanted to leave. Then he asked, would you like to leave with me? And held out his hand. I got such a bad feeling from him that I said no. He started promising me that if I went with him that I could go back to my childhood home, back to what was so familiar and happy to me. But I refused, and then I woke up. After that, I told my sister everything. From the shadow man that I saw first, to all the dreams that I had. At first, we thought that maybe I was having some sort of psychic visions, but a few years later, I found out the truth. I found out that the silhouette that I saw was a shadow person after I watched a video by Haley Reese on what they are. Then a couple more years later, after meeting my boyfriend, whose whole family is very into the supernatural, I found out what the whole thing actually meant. He explained to me that demons often come to you in dreams to attempt to possess you. They'll start by creating a situation that's familiar and comforting. But after a dream or two, they start adding or taking things away, slowly, so as not to make it obvious. You start to become uncomfortable and threatened and scared, until one time they're the only thing that makes you feel safe. And that's when they have you. They'll promise you everything good you could ever want, and as soon as you say yes, you're saying yes to them taking over your body. My boyfriend explained that I was very smart for saying no, and for telling my sister. Because by telling my sister, I basically broke the demon's hold. That's apparently why back in the old days, people would tell their dreams to someone. Because it basically breaks the hold of whatever demon or spirit may be trying to possess you. When I was a kid, I was with my family on a road trip a few hours away. We were driving down through a winding canyon, and it was dark. I was looking out my window, just staring at the dirt walls that we were passing. It was like the inside of cliffs on one side and forest on the other. Well, I was on the side of the car with the dirt hills and the cliff walls, and as we turned to go around a bend, I saw something human-shaped, which looked like it had a long, white face that resembled the scream mask hanging on the hillside. It happened so fast that it scared me to death nearly. I never said anything. I think it was because I wasn't sure what I had just seen, but I really don't think that it was a human being. This vivid memory is still clear as day. In 2007, I moved into the house I currently live in. It's over a hundred years old, and ever since I can remember, there have been weird or creepy things that occur. Recently, I've heard noises late at night while I'm in bed. For context, I sleep on the top floor of my house, and it's been getting really creepy. Another thing is that in the hallway, we have an attic door that's bolted shut and hasn't been opened by our family or my neighbors who used to live here from what I have been told. I decided to ask my father about it and he told me that it wasn't a full-size attic and is more of a crawl space which goes right over my room. And the part that creeps me out the most is that we've never had any animals besides the occasional mouse in our home which makes me think that what I'm hearing doesn't sound like an animal at all. <laughs> 